Look at that. Run, girl, run! <laughs> oh my goodness. Happy Halloween, gatekeepers. You want to talk about werewolves and dogmen and all this fun Halloween stuff? Are you, you feeling good and spooky? Feeling good and spooky. Happy Halloween. Here we go. Golly, can you imagine? Woo, being up a tree. And you got that jumping up trying to get you. Oh my gosh. What are we doing still going in the woods? Why aren't we wrapped in bubble wrap and lock all the doors and bar, bar what was that? Old saying, uh, guard the barn door, Sally or something. Oh. We just lost Ron. He just popped out. He was here and then he pooped out. He popped out. He just poofed. Okay. So I'll fill some time. Take your time, Ron, if you can hear us. Hey, Froze. Welcome in. Welcome in, horse. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome, Yoda girl. Welcome, straw dog. Welcome in. Fixing dough. Travis, hello, hello. Catherine, thank you. Thank you for saying that about the videos. I hope the videos help. Basically, I do it for multiple reasons. I say that all the time. But just in case people are out there listening, why are the intros so long? If we're going someplace dark, I throw a bunch of stuff out there, not only just to get you in the mood, but a couple of, you know, fun things to kind of lift your vibration up so you can kind of put up a, your own light shield, you know, away from all this darkness we're going to talk about. This is some dark stuff, people. And I'm going to tell you right now, disclaimer, I don't want to lose anybody in the chat. If you don't like what we're talking about tonight, come on on tomorrow night with Steve if this is too much. Because we tell the truth here as best we know it at this time, you know, in our, it, right now. And wait a minute, I'm getting messages. Hold on. He's loading back up. Take your time, Ron. It's okay. <laughs> Wait a second. Let me tell him. Oh my goodness. The tech, the tech uh, dust bunnies are out there. So, um, anyhow, welcome in. I hope uh, some of you, uh, I saw you in the live chat when we were doing Cabin 22. I can't thank you, uh, you guys enough. Always makes the Halloween, always a great tradition. You know, I wrote the darn thing and I always hear things that, you know, for, for it feels like the first time, you know, you forget how much you love rage and how much you love Tater and how much you're pulling for Tater. And, you know, you kind of try to try to understand <clears throat> why is Tater like he is? Why is Jeb like he is? Why is, you know, why Skeet do the things he does? Um, all the different characters. And not only that, you've got cryptids, you got Bigfoot and. Of course, you have La Rougarou, and we're going to be talking about him tonight. And um, I hear our guest tonight listen to a little bit of, uh, and Buck, old Buck. One of my favorite parts in that is when Buck gets his revenge and gets the ear. And if you haven't heard Cabin 22, I don't want to tell you how that all goes down. But there was this kind of Moby Dick thing going on between old Buck and, um, and Skeeter Davis. And... Buck kept eluding Skeeter and he took it personal and it was a vengeful revenge thing. And um, he wound up uh, kind of getting the best of him <laughs> to say the least, but it is a lovely Halloween tradition. And I appreciate everybody being here. It's, I know it's a long, almost 15 hours of content, but if um, you're looking for a haunting uh, tale and one that has everything from moonshiners to, UFOs um, to mediums and psychics and seances and soul collectors and demon ghost children and haunted playgrounds and haunted cabins and murder mystery and missing people. And, and I, I don't even think I scratched the surface. So there you go. And a fight between good and evil and a battle for, you know, all times. So. 
<laughs> what more could you ask for, right? So thank you for everybody that was there. I hope you're planning uh, a, a, a lot this Halloween. I hope you're celebrating however it is that you celebrated. If you're carving pumpkins or you're handing out candy or you're collecting candy or whatever. But uh, when you're walking in the woods, um, does it ever cross your mind? Um, have you ever heard something following next to you? Um, have you ever thought you saw a shadow person um, or a shadow in the corn? Um, there was a story, and this young man that's going to be on tonight, um, I wanted to look up on werewolves, and I wanted to look up on, um, hey, Annette, and welcome in, darling. I hope you find this finds you well, love. Um, everybody needs healing energy. Just please uh, take it. That's why we keep this chat uh, chill and we welcome everybody in and we just throw out good energy and we try to learn about the subject uh, from people who know and uh, from each other. So anyhow, I was looking uh, for good documentaries and I pulled up this one and it was called American Werewolves. And I started watching. I'm going, well, this is well produced. And I said, it's going to be good and I'm, I'm going to learn something from it. And I start listening to it. And the first person that they brought up that was talking about it was, was Ron Murphy. And I'm listening to everything, of course, that went on in this. And one of the stories was uh, a man uh, lived rural, uh, lots of cornfields and farms around him. And he decided he was going to join this marathon or whatever. And he was going to start training again to run. He liked to run. Um, and in this case, he started late in the season, corn was high and he had waited. He usually did it in the late, early afternoon, late afternoon, but this day he, um, he pushed it off, pushed it off. So it was, it was later. So he decided he was going to go ahead and run anyway, because he was going to welcome in black dragon. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Sapphire, for helping me watch the chat and keeping it on topic. Um, is he having a hard time? Let me send him another one just to see. Hold on. Ron, if you can hear me, honey, I'm going to send you another link. Just follow this one and see if this helps. So anyway, the guy decided that he was going to uh, run, even though it was going to be late. Um, let me see. Gee, this thing's giving me a hard time. Hold on one second. There he is. Do, 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 do. Try that one. I'm typing out. Okay. I'm typing out that I sent him another one. We'll see if that works. So anyway, so he decides he's going to run. Um, so he doesn't lose a day. He's going to run late. It's getting dark and whatever. So he's running down this rural road. And of course, on both sides is cornfield. I've been there. I know exactly what that feels like and exactly how that feels when you, you know, you're right up against it like that. So he's running and all of a sudden he realizes something's running with him, much like cabin 22. Bow, bow, bow. So something's running with him. And when he stops, it stops. And he, 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 he goes again and it goes with him. And he's estimating this thing as he's running. He's trying to sort what to do and process and his information. He thinks it's about, you know, four or five uh, rows in away from him. And he's running and running. And, of course, it's keeping pace with him. And he's trying to decide what to do. And he's trying to figure out what this would be. You know, would a dog do this possible? You know, it's not a, a bobcat or whatever. A deer, deer would run away. And he's doing processing all this stuff as he's running. His heart's pounding. And he, he starts to run and he decides, okay, uh, if I can't outrun this thing, whatever it may be, um, my friend lives not too far right at the end of this cornfield. If I just take a right, I'll be in his yard and I'll be able to uh, get help or whatever he's thinking. So he, that's his plan. He's going to run, he's going to dart, and he's going to, you know, full tilt boogie head for this guy's, uh, his friend's uh, house. So he's running and running and running. And then he realizes, oh, my God, well, when the cornfield runs out, the thing will run out, literally. You know, and be right there in full view, whatever the hell this is. It's chasing him and keeping pace with him and running with him. 
and he can hear it breathing and he can hear it, you know, like it's like growls and all this other stuff coming from him. So he says, that's it. He doesn't know what else to do. So he just sticks with the plan and he runs and he, the cornfield breaks and he says, I'm not going to look, I'm not going to look, I'm not going to look. And the guy says he couldn't help it. He turns around and he looks and he gets a full view of this thing. It's a full on dog, man, full on the thing is huge, all, you know, muscular. It's, it's growling. It comes popping out of the corn and it's, you know, it's, you know, I forget what color he said the eyes were and all this, but anyway, it's in the show. Watch it. American werewolves. It's really, really good. So he doesn't know what to do. Right. So he's still running, but he's looking. He's like, don't look, don't look. It's too late. He saw it. So he takes off for his friend's house and the guy's got a chain link fence, puts it, does the tow hook thing, throws his legs over. Thank God. You know, he had a little bit of that in him, throws his legs over lands. He's got about two, three, four feet to go. And there's a pool. His friend's got a big old pool. So he runs and he dives and it lands into the pool and sinks to the bottom. He holds his nose. So he sinks to the bottom. He's just holding his breath. Oh my God. Can you imagine? He's holding his breath and he's like, got his eyes closed. He's sinking to the bottom of the pool. Oh my God. Waiting for this thing to jump in or look it up and see in that through the, through the water. Can you imagine? Do you know this thing hunched over looking at you? God, can you imagine this werewolf thing? And that's what he's thinking. And he finally opens his eyes and he looks and the thing is gone. And he finally gets the guts and running out of air. And he comes to the top and the thing is gone. He has no idea where this thing is. He busts into his friend's house, kicks the door open practically. The guy helps him lock down the house and they sit and they wait and they never saw it again. Can you imagine? Did you ever have something run alongside of you or walk alongside of you? Or hear something following you in the woods? We need to send out a... We need, <laughs> we need to send out a posse for Ron. I can't get him. All right, let me do this again. Let me try possibly an email. He was in once. He should be able to get in again. I don't know why it uh it kicked him out once he was here, unless he's having a bandwidth issue or his internet's going in and out. Do, 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 do. Ron, can you hear me? Try that one, hon. So anyway, isn't that crazy? So that is called American Werewolves. It is free to watch on YouTube. Uh, mods, if you so desire, one of you could find that link. It's free to watch. Um, I don't know about other countries, but if not, look it up. It might be on Amazon Prime or something like that or, you know, Pluto or something. How are you guys doing? You always felt safe walking in the woods? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, um, I've had got, walked in the woods and had them go silent and still several times and definitely felt to stop and go back and hear, don't push on kind of thing. You know, absolutely, without a doubt. Yep. I don't know why Ron's having a hard time getting in here. Hon, if you can hear me. Try that. If you want me to send it through your email, I'll be happy to give it a try. But I figure since it let him through once, it probably let him through again. It just kicked him off again. But I'll tell you what, we could talk about some of Ron's books. Um, this uh, gentleman is a wonderful author. When I met him, uh, Brian Bowden introduced us at a uh, Paracon. And um, he, uh, we just happened to be standing in front of his presentation table and he had all these books. And I said, well, let's come on. I'll tell you what you come on. Oh, okay. He's still trying. So he's, he's still plugging at it. God bless him. Send him healing vibes Send healing vibes to Ron's, Ron's computer, Th sling some bacon at it. Maybe some uh, jack-o'-lanterns. Let me see if I can find some, some jack-o'-lanterns and some bacon. We'll try that. I mean, it's Halloween. Don't jack-o'-lanterns and, and bacon have extra power now? Let's throw in a black cat. What else we got? And a ghost. That's good Halloween energy, right? Okay. Let's toss that out towards Ron and hope that it heals his computer. There you go. Accept that. Put that all around the computer, Ron. We'll see if we can't you know, find a crack to get you in. Get you in. So, um, yeah. I mean... In the woods, that's, you know, oh, 
one comments got one. I once was riding my bike to work around 3 a.m. Uh oh, and a deer in the brush beside me was running along with me and scared the crap out of me. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That's real fear. And, you know, and how much do you know about here comes all the pumpkins and bacon? Probably go well together. Now, see, maybe some grilled pumpkin wrapped in bacon. I don't know, maybe uh, filet mignon wrapped around it or something. That would be good. I'm hungry. But um, that's real fear, especially when you're out there and you, you, you feel there's something wrong. I think you feel it before. Here comes all the bacon. Thank you. Bacon power. Get it. Get it, Ron. Look, there's so much pumpkin, pumpkin love and, and bacon love in here for you right now. You got to come in here and tell us about dog men. Don't let the universe hold you back. Plow through it. So, <laughs> right. So that's the thing. It's, it's that primal fear, right? That fight or, you know, fight or flight, but think about it. You can really get yourself all worked up just looking outside the window. You know, you're looking out the window and you're looking at the wood line and you get a feeling that something's looking back out at, at, out at you. And some of the biggest arguments or at least debates, let's call it that, that I've heard in this uh, in this field is not whether or not, you know, so much that things exist, but this thing does this, this does that. Um, this one can't do that. This ghost can't do that. Ghosts don't or aren't allowed to to do this. And then you find out, you know, fifty stories where the ghost is doing just that. You know, um, that's how this field is. So if we could just take off all of that, you know, take off that almost like taking off a coat and, and putting it in coat check. Everything that you believe about these things and Bigfoot and everything else. And just imagine that there has been something said about dogmen, whether it's a hieroglyph in Egypt, whether it's, you know, thousands of years back, all across the globe, in multiple cultures, some type of human dog combination, right? And it's just like the same can be said for ghosts, UFOs, aliens, Bigfoot. We say it every time we do one of these shows. We say the same thing. This goes back thousands of years. It's in art. It's in, it's biblical. It's, it's in old, um, scrolls found here or there you know it's in childhood stories in fables in tales in uh you know grim's this and grandma's that and people passing along the stories uh tribal among um you know whole villages and carry it through generations and pass it along and pass it along almost every one of those categories ghosts UFOs, aliens, hairy man, wild man, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Sagway, dog man, wolf man, vampire, bloodsuckers, zombies, zombies. It just seems interesting to me how you can go so far back. And I wonder if you know, if you went back to uh, to tribal days when we were in cabins and uh, I think he's still trying, folks. I think he's trying to update his computer or something's happening there. So we're going to just keep rambling on. If not, I have more videos. Trust me. So <clears throat> in tribal days when they were sitting around the campfire or around the cave trying to stay warm and get through a winter's night, if they were telling stories about the dog man thing. They most certainly were killing things like wolf and bear, tiger in the jungle, right? Elk, all these different things to take on its personality, to don its, its you know, as a, almost like a costume like we do on Halloween. You know, when we get dressed up as Halloween, don't you act, if you're dressing up like Flash, don't you try to zip around and act all, you know, all fast? You know, if you're Batman, don't you stand there and, you know, act, you know, however Batman acts, you know, but think about it. Cosplay, 
all that kind of stuff. Let's not get kinky and crazy, but you know what I'm saying? If you're dressing up, even as a kid for Halloween, you know, if you were a chef or a ghost or a skeleton or a Frankenstein, you acted like that character. It's not, it's not unlike uh, a tribal ceremonies, whether you're in the Congo or if you're in Tibet or if you're in, you know, a, a, a Navajo, a, a Cheyenne dog soldier or, you know, on, on and on and on. A uh hun. -huh. They certainly uh, took characteristics from animals and um, the Aztecs and the Mayans that um, would consume uh, their prey, their um, Achilla deer or whatever, <clears throat> and think that they absorbed that energy of that animal or that person in a lot of uh, cases, right? How many times we've heard the story of, you know, they can consume the liver or they consume the heart or, or the whatever of that kill to absorb the energies and the um, abilities and even knowledge in a lot of cases of that animal or that thing, right? Goes way, way back. Right, Froze? What are you saying to me, hon? Speak it here. Dog men and their <laughs> mean women do more. There you go. Yep. Take a mean woman to stand up to a dog man, right? No, oh, I guess Jim, I mean, he went in and out of consciousness even when he was awake, but he said some things that made you think, didn't he? So, um, hey, thanks, Yoda girl. Yep, that's my stuff. I don't talk about dog men. I've never seen one, uh, to my knowledge. Um, I have friends who have. I have um, <laughs> more than. More than more than I'm comfortable with, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I mean, that sounds funny, but yeah, quite a few people that have seen actually seen Dogman. I've seen a Bigfoot. I've never seen a Dogman. Definitely saw a Bigfoot. Seen a lot of other weird things, but uh, never seen. It. And I don't, you know, I'm not saying I want to either, because um, here's the thing. Oh, I heard a pop. Oh my goodness. Okay. So, you well, you missed your introduction. So, this is that guy a little bit ago I was telling you about. He's here, and he's fantastic. He is author of multiple titles, and all of them um, having to do with this genre. And a couple of surprises that are kind of outside this genre that uh, seem very intriguing. And um, I'm proud to call him a friend. And it's so cool, because when I met Ron Murphy... A lot of people think, okay, well, you got a great, you know, a, a guest for, you know, forever. And you have the, all these things are true and great interviews and everything else. But he filled in so many spots on my, I got a guy list. <laughs> now I got one for mermaids and I got one for this and some fairies and all this other stuff. So, you know, it's just, it, it just tickles me pink to just uh, introduce you to Ron Murphy. If you've never met him before. But if you have, you know, he's a friend of this show, one of us, and absolutely a, a chat favorite. Mr. Ron Murphy, get in here, honey. Boy, I can't hear you, darling. You're muted, sweetheart. There Just we hit go. Your... There, there we go. Yes. You know what? And, and I don't understand what happened. Spartans to get in here. <laughs> That's right. And I texted you, like, I've been trying to get on since about okay. a quarter to eight. And then when I was finally on, and all of a sudden, I started seeing my screen start min min minimizing. So, oh, wow. I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. Hey, sweetie. Welcome yes. in. Welcome in. So, here we go. We're just going to talk some business real quick. Don't mind us. So, what I did was tonight, I set it up. I know you're a very busy man. So, I set it up so you can... Feel free to stay as long as you like. I know you work early. You have, uh, you know, uh, other, you, you have to get out and fight dragons, I think you said, <laughs> right? That's early right. in the morning, before dawn. Right. Just relentless, this man. So, uh, keep, have you seen any dragons lately? I, I've not, but I'm still so, looking. As soon there as I you go. One, yeah. Well, this is, <laughs> so you go when you feel comfortable because I have a surprise for the chat tonight for Halloween. So I set it up to where you don't have to feel like you need to stay if you don't want to and no. you know, if you have to sleep. So, yeah, I'm going to give you until 930. I, I was going to give you guys a full hour and a half, but perfect. we'll still get plenty of stuff in. 
perfect. So I just will see. There you go. So everybody's, you know, we'll take you as long as we can get you for as long as we can get you. Ron. I love gotcha. you so much. So how are you been? You do you doing good? Uh, I've been doing well. My kids had a bit of a virus that was going on. Oh my goodness. Uh, but yeah, but uh, I, I think everything is pretty well status quo now. Uh, hopefully I, I feel good. I feel, I'm fe feeling good, Cisco. I'm feeling good today. Isn't it crazy, Ron? So here we are. We meet again. We, mm -hmm. we sat, we've talked vampires. We've talked Bigfoot, not mm -hmm. so much more than Bigfoot. We've talked about many other things and, and ghosts and goblins and gotta get you or whatever you, whatever's under the bed, the boogeyman. And you know what takes us out? A tiny little microorganism that comes in and hits you, you know, that we breathe in or whatever. And the next thing you know, we're on our knees praying to, you know, the porcelain gods just begging for you know and it wasn't a dog man that took us out it wasn't a you know an alien it was a microorganism it's the story exactly of our right. lives it's the story of humanity and that is a great lead-in because when last we talked about vampires we talked about them being the personification of different types of illnesses so this is very inappropriate so you think about this you know the way that you allow a vampire into your house or the way a vampire gets into your house is they have to right. you have to allow them right so by allowing somebody in your house that may have some sort of communicable disease that is a good way to get yourself killed back in the middle ages and but but but, but werewolves now this is what's this is what's curious about this right Unlike the vampire and, and that kind of mythos, you have the, the the werewolf that actually is a predator that will hunt you down. It's very bestial compared to almost that that simmering elegance of of, of a count. You know, the, the werewolves are these very, uh, you know, these these are animals with a human intelligence or the intelligence of a human that's transformed into animal form, whichever ways you want to look at it, you know, and yeah, vice versa. Or both, or both. Because or I'm, both. I'm of, I'm of, I'm of the, the group in all of these things that just like I look at a chihuahua must be really pissed if they tell him, look, you see that wolf over there, <laughs> you know, and not to knock chihuahuas, but that is a far cry. From a wolf you know or whatever right. wolf was you know when it started because we've messed around in it same with look i'm a floral designer right yes. i see flowers i see roses that i know what they looked like in the 60s i know what they look like in the 70s they're so different they've crossed them to try to make them last longer um more of it grow faster su survive disease but they gave up um the, the the smell they don't smell anymore because that's one of the things that makes them open and, and die quicker so i mean we're always giving up or gaining giving up because humans can't keep their hands off so i think there's the natural you know whatever dog man were, were, werewolf started i think two separate things mm -hmm. that's just my thoughts now but also within those two separate things many different categories over time you know the ones that have um uh you know had to evolve for its culture for its survival and then others that were raised in or and and you know survived in other other ways also came up different and we still keep trying to put it all in that box right ron and we and that's that's correct because we as humans like to categorize things because yeah. once we label something or put it in the box we take ownership of it and one of the things that the werewolf mythology does it kind of usurps our understanding of the world because we cannot control that part of nature and not only cannot we can we cannot control that part of nature but if that part of nature gets into us then we lose our human rate reason and now nature controls us. Do you see? So that's mm -hmm. one of the scary things about, uh, about the werewolf. We th see from, you know, the, the wolf man, uh, even those people that say their prayers by night, even people of faith can be corrupted by whatever the werewolf means and whatever culture we're talking about. And that's mm -hmm. the frightening thing that you could be, you know, unlike with a vampire and you could use the talismans of, you know, religious artifacts, the werewolf doesn't care about that, right? It doesn't care about that. So we are at its mercy. And, and like I said, we as human beings fear things that we cannot control. That's amazing. I'm also slinging bacon that they're slinging at you, Ron. You're being covered in bacon and jack-o'-lanterns, it appears. And so I'm Whoa. just throwing them at you on my the ricochet 
right back at you. So isn't that wonderful? It, it is. Lots absolutely. of bacon love. Lots yeah, of bacon love. The reason why but I, I agree with everything you're saying, you know, um, again, I think one of the things that people argue the most about at Paracons and things like that, if you know, dogmen, uh, different from the Maruguru, different from the werewolf, uh, alien connection, UFO, and then mm -hmm. the arrows start coming and Bigfoot and then God forbid, you know, if you bring in something else like um you know, this mass consciousness of everything being connected. And then what is man messed with? Because, you know, going from bookends from beginning, you know, Egyptian and, be and beyond to now, Ron, I think we've messed around and created some super soldiers here. Mm -hmm. that was I'm kind of there. Yeah, the last conference I was at in Dallas that talked about uh, werewolves, that was really one of the main topics that were being covered, that humanity has, has taken their hands in dabbled around a little bit too much, and that is what we've come up with. And it's, it's very possible. I mean, there's a lot of people that think that that is what's going on, that we are capable of doing such things. And we as human beings have done things, you know, even though we set laws against them, you can just imagine what kind of gene splicing has been done and what kind of really evil. Exactly. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. The, the things that we've done that are so horrific, people would be able to sleep anymore if they knew. That's right. And these are and, you know, and this has been going on. You know, I could tell you things that happened in 1968 that were done just to see how quickly people would go to uh, emergency rooms. Let's see how good this works. Mm -hmm. You know, different things like this. So, of course, there. you know, how many times we've all heard experimental uh, lab monkeys mm -hmm. uh, uh, got got loose in, right. you know, whatever uh, in the, the wilds of West Virginia, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> there's That's some right. other kind of thing. And I've heard there's the dogmen have been seen in Hagerstown mm. in, in Maryland and the woods there. I mean, this is not something that some old lady told a story once on a porch that this might've happened in the Appalachian trail once when she was a girl, this is multiple people, multiple sightings, different strengths of dog men or, and things like that. Probably less of werewolf unless you're talking about, um, oh, uh, what's her dear name? Um, she just passed. <coughs> Willie Godfrey. Thank you. Yep. Uh, uh, and her Beast of Bray Road and, and that type of thing. And, mm -hmm. and the type of werewolves that would come out and obviously have clothes like torn, uh, uh, bless, you know, blouses and, you know, shirts and things and, you know, that kind of stuff. I, th there's definitely a difference. There's more than one thing going on, Ron. There is. So the werewolf mystique and the uh, werewolf legend is is ancient, right? So as far as we can go back, we know that the shaman, you know, the priests of you know uh, of pre uh, scientific societies they were capable of straddling the two worlds at one time of the animal and of nature and of mankind. And by going into the world of the animal, they could bring back knowledge that was needed in our world. So the idea of shape shifting or transforming was part of their psyche. You know, that was, that was their job. That's what they did. And a lot of the tales that we are, are told by about werewolves, whether it's in Europe or even North American, I have some great stories about some North American um, uh, 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 tribes that uh, had uh, werewolf cults. Um, it was um, it was something to be there was something to be gained there, right? It was not so mm -hmm. much fear involved; it was the idea of being able to go from this human form and transform yourself into the animal, and in a way, you become linked into that all in all, right? That oneness, right? Mm -hmm. So you complete that cycle. So if we'll look at the uh, the idea of the shamanism, so that was something that was to be accepted. It was it was set up by the priestly class, and um, even in in uh, uh, Egyptian mythology, we have Anubis, you know, guardian mm -hmm. of the dead, uh, you know, the psychopompus, somebody that transfers the the, the soul of the living uh, to the realm of the afterlife. And uh, as the picture shows right there, you have the uh, the, the legend of uh, Lycan, right, of Lycaon. Uh, so that's where we get the word lycanthropy from. And as the story goes, um, this happened in a place called Arcadia uh, in Greece. Um, and Arcadia was one of these interesting places because it was very, con it was considered backwoods. This wasn't, um, it would be kind of like if you lived in New York City and you talked about the people of West Virginia, that's what this was like, right? Okay. And, um, and there was a werewolf cult 
that existed in Arcadia that predates this, this story that I'm going to talk about by at least several thousand years. You know, there's a, a lot of tradition there. Uh, but as the story goes, um, the god Zeus took human form and uh, he visited uh, the king of Arcadia, uh, Lycaon, Le- Le- you know, and um, Lycaon wanted to test the god and see exactly how omniscient he was. So he killed one of his children and served Zeus human flesh human yes. flesh. Uh, yeah so zeus immediately uh realizes what what's going on and he transforms like like lichen into a werewolf and that's where we get the original werewolf and it's been said that there's werewolves there even to this very day because of this curse mm-hmm. a lot of different things going on here right we do know that the ancient world was full of human sacrifices. We see this prevailing taboo against human sacrifices in many religions. Even in the Judaic religion, we see where Abraham goes up to the mountain and God says, sacrifice your son Isaac. And, uh, you know, then God pulls back and says, no, 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 don't do that. That is a memory of when we as human beings used to sacrifice the ultimate sacrifice in order to have something come in for, for our, our accomplishments, right? It's, it's some way to get to the gods and a regular offering does not matter. So I think that this harkens back to that and it shows that these lingering types of um, practices were now despised by civilized cultures, right? I think there's a lot that, 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 that is to be said there. And the one slide you showed before this, this is a Viking representation of, mm-hmm. of, of uh, their idea of shapeshifters because in the Viking culture, you know, even though we're going back, you know, 700, around 700 when the Viking culture began, um, they believed that you could put on the pelts of certain animals and um, attain those kind of, uh, of traits. Uh, so we have the berserker, which is the bear shirter, because you'll put on a, mm-hmm. a shirt of a bear, and you would think that that would, was what's going. On. But then the wolf hider, or if I can pronounce that right, and I'm sure <laughs> completely. But basically, it was somebody that wears the, the skins of a wolf, and um, they were also called drinkers of blood. So by putting on a a pelt of an animal uh, and uh, enough psychedelic mushrooms, you could assume that animals power and go into battle and they were very fearful you can imagine a group of vikings you know over in the corner completely naked except wearing a wolf skin how mm-hmm. before they attack you i mean this is mm-hmm. really the stuff of, of of nightmares and i think this is the the, the pool where our nightmares are drawn from you know these are c- cultural memories that we have and in the case of uh you know carl Jung's idea of a collective unconscious that kind of feeds into these nightmares so that right there that you have uh which is a uh, an artistic representation of uh of a uh, a relief uh during the viking age um mm-hmm. we can see both of these uh elements uh here as well so yeah the idea of transforming whoop no no <laughs> Oh, yeah. That's my computer. It sounds like a robot going off, like somebody knocked over one of those Robbie the Robots. It does. See, there's something going on. Like, where there they is. don't want us to talk about. Hold I on, know. guys. Hang on. Hang take on. Your, hang take on, your time. On. Take your time. Oh, my goodness. There he goes. Just mention it, you know, berserkers and all that kind of stuff. Yep, exactly. So, here's what I was thinking. He was talking about that. This is not unlike anything, you know, Cheyenne dog soldiers, um, multiple different cultures of putting on, you know, the head of a bear or a deer head or an elk or um, a wolf uh, across the board, across the board. So many, you can't even mention it. It did kind of sound like a typewriter going off. Like, you know, you know, the minute I heard it, though, it sounded kind of like if you could think back to the old Robbie the Robots, they had like a, a big key in the back. And it, w- it was kind of very metal sounding and very quick. And all its gears moved really fast. It sounded just like that. It sounded like one of those Robbie the Robots fell over and there he went. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Oh, I think, oh, device not connected, it says. He's popping in. I'm eating chocolate. There we go. All there right, go. I'm back. Wow. So what I did is I just cut out the middleman, and now I'm on my phone. So I hope that this will work out okay. 
It's fabulous, Rob. It's fabulous. It did. I swear it sounded like Robbie the Robot. Are you comfortable like you are? Oh, absolutely. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. No, no words. Something doesn't want us to tell our story tonight, Cisco. It's so true. We're just going to fight right on because, boy, I'll tell you what. I'm like a pit bull when it comes to this kind of stuff. So it just makes you trudge on further, dig in, lead into the torpedo. Let's do this. You know what I mean? That's right. That's right. What do we so, know yeah, that we they don't want us to say? What do we know? I, I don't do? know. I don't know. We'll have to I see before the show ends. I know. I might have done it with Super Soldier. So what I was saying, too, is what you were describing, whether this picture or not. First of all, Vikings uh, with uh, the movies Pathfinder and, and stories like this. We know the Vikings came over, you know, China was here, you know, Columbus, what? I mean, all of these bit back and forth. They, we were used for the, uh, like a train for like their Olympics of, you know, the Vikings. And of course, it's so strange to have these two things battling the way they did when they, you know, they're, it's not a, they're not unlike each other is what I'm trying to say. And, and it's all this culture shock and lost in translation and, you know, death because, you know, a, a misunderstanding or somebody's not translating it correctly. It's just crazy to me because they didn't even stop to realize they're both um, adorning themselves with the same type of thing, nature. You know, you've got Vikings trying to draw from the bear. He, they're wearing bear skins. Um We've got the uh, East Coast Indians and and all the way through uh, in uh, wolf pelts and deer heads and buck and you know these type of things. it's crazy. You, no matter where you oh, look on the globe, they all did it. They did. So let's talk a little bit because uh, about the Ohio River Valley. Um, so we okay. can probably go back, yeah, and this isn't going to this be ancient history. Yeah, this is sometime around. Um, uh, maybe 800 AD, something like that. Okay. So we're not talking about ancient history, but what is curious, and again, you know, they might shut us down for this. We <laughs> know that the, yeah, we know that the Vikings were in Canada by about eight or nine hundred AD, right? We know that they were there because we have a site in Newfoundland called Blonsa Meadows, and we know it's a Viking uh, site without question. We also know that whenever the Vikings came to the New World, they um, encountered something called a scraling, if you've ever heard of that term. And that was a, a, a creature uh, that was ferocious, uh, had black eyes. Some people claim that it was an early Bigfoot sighting. Uh, a mainstream academia claims that it was a sighting or interactions with the Inuit people. Uh, but if we look at the same time that the Vikings were encountering the scralings, uh, in the, the Canadian area, Iceland area, uh, they in Greenland, uh, th this was also the time that Beowulf was being written. So we have this kind of connection, you know, so we'll start connecting the dots, right? So if we go to Jamestown, Virginia, there is a walk there that shows when every state was settled uh, by, um, by Europeans. And this is actually a government site, right? And the first state that was settled by settlers it says that it was Maine around 1000 AD, and the government claims that there, the Vikings had come down that far. And if they came down as far as Maine, there's no reason why they didn't come even further. So when we start connecting the dots, we see that around this time, around this you know mystical 1000 AD, really strange things start happening in the United States. We have effigy mounds being built. We have the Great Serpent Mound in Chillicothe, Ohio, that is very reminiscent of that type of swirling Viking art. Um, and also in the Ohio River Valley, we have what 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 what, what anthropologists called uh, the cult of the werewolf. You know, these aren't my words; these were the people that that excavated this site. And um, in Kentucky, uh, not very far from land between the lakes where, you know, whatever, something strange happened. Uh, but in Kentucky, there is a burial site there that shows that there was somebody, obviously of great prominence within the tribe, uh, that was buried in, in bear skins and animal skins to appear as if their body is covered in hair. And the, 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 uh, the face after, after death, parts of it was actually removed so they could take the skull of a wolf 
and place it over the human face to look like the person was in the act of transforming into that wolf. And we can say, oh, you know what, that's a really, really amazing. Uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, it, but, but it's not a standard. But I will point out that indeed for at least a little while, that was practiced in not only that particular place in Kentucky, but other areas in the Ohio River Valley as well, because it meant something to them. So whenever I talk about this kind of stuff, you could look at acts and act or ask what they were trying to get at. So we got something called imitative magic, which is the people that did that was imitating something that they saw in the natural world that they were in awe and wonder about. Okay. So we see like out in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the Midwest area, we see um, the Hopi Indians doing the kachina dance, you know, making kachinas and doing the, the dances and they will dress up like thunderbirds or sometimes even, even wolves as well too. So we know that that means something to somebody. So are these burials a reminder that Native Americans were facing or seeing these creatures in the woods at around 1000 AD. Or if it's not imitative magic, could it be sympathetic magic, which means that there was something out in our environment that was so terrifying to the Native American that they would take on the attributes of what was scaring them and attempt to, in a form of, 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 of totem, to keep that away from the tribe. So there's different ways to look at this, you know, and there's different ways to approach this from a very anthropological and sociological point of view. People don't do anything or they don't do things for no reason whatsoever. A lot of time and energy went into this. Uh, to, to imagine that you have to take somebody from your tribe and remove teeth and parts of their jaw to put a wolf skull over it. To this meant this. something. Yep, this meant it's something. Not unlike, it's not unlike the rituals going through to a foot binding or uh, elongating skulls or, That's right. um, you know, name your, uh, <laughs> name your thing here with the, the neck with the rain yes. where is yep. this from with you why would you want your your neck to be so elongated but it's also ron very much with um the native american side of the whole thing i don't think people realize how much that's imitated very much like in in asian culture tai chi or the martial mm -hmm. arts are imitating nature and taking mm -hmm. on those skills it's very goes very deep in a lot of native cultures as far mm -hmm. as even saying you have crow medicine mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. i was told i was uh, i was uh clear well there's a process you go through but but basically in 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 this circle anyway you have to be cleared to be able you can't just go and wear a turkey feather you can't just go mm -hmm. and you know wear an eagle feather or whatever you have to be cleared to wear that because you have to carry that medicine within you. And it, it's a reflection of yourself coming forward. And you, you know, that the relationship you have with that knowledge, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you, certain things you wear are going to have reflect those characteristics. So say um, I was cleared and told that I could, um, I had buzzard medicine. Mm -hmm. At first I hear that you think, Ooh, you know, well, as they explain, and here comes that culture differential. Here comes that um, lost in translation I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Here comes that um, not realizing how close uh, our beliefs, at least our morals and our um, our likes and dislikes and our fears and and our, our and our joys are also similar. It's, it's wild, but when you think about this, I was told you're cleared to wear buzzard medicine. And of course they sit back and they smile because they know your reaction is going to be what, unless you know, well, it's actually very beautiful. It's the quite the opposite of 180. It's I have the ability to take a negative and turn it to a positive. Like a buzzard takes garbage, but turns it to a positive and puts it back out there. And then into the circle of life, he goes, you know, now nourished right. and moved on and turned to a positive. And it's, it's just life traits. 
But these things are taken from nature in so many ways, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and you wonder, and Edna mentioned here in chat and some other people too, that the shapeshifter, which I believe personally is a whole different category. I would consider that different than a werewolf because to me, werewolf is that universal pictures of, you know, of the reluctant uh, beast that, you know, the full moon, here it comes and chain me inside the barn. I don't want to harm anybody kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, and, and even the more romantic visions uh, brought forth earlier, uh, we did with vampires too, you know, mm -hmm. we always do. Mm -hmm. We ought to mess with everything. But even the vampire, you know, what you would think a werewolf would be now, whether it's a teen werewolf or American mm -hmm. werewolf in London or any of those. You know, I think those are different categories as well. Do you, the shape-shifting and the werewolf, different categories? Yeah, or oh, not? absolutely. They, they mean something different to us as well, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, we talk about the dogman. We talk about Linda Godfrey. Uh, the places where the, the dogman was, was first seen um, was in the Great Lakes area, right? And in those areas, there are a lot of uh, Indian burial mounds. And... The the, yes. the the dog man, especially, I mean, if you look at the, the work of uh, Linda Godfrey, this was a creature that was intrinsically attached to the Native American culture in a way that they became a, a protective spirit of the dead. They were kind of like the guard dogs of the the, 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 the deceased, right? It, it, was, it was the guardian of that sacred liminal space between life and death. And so it's true. Odd. So true, yeah. Ron. So many stories. Not just to jump in here. Not I hate oh, to cut you off. I get no. excited. I have paranormal Tourette's. You have to understand. <laughs> I cannot help. I'm really, like, yeah. And there's a story. You know what? I get so excited. But so many stories about dogmen guarding uh, Indian mounds or digging in them or That's right. um, showing up around them when others are uh, desecrating or vandalizing um, these kind of stories. But a lot of times it's just walking in, um, you know, into their world and, and they're in the middle of doing something, like I said, digging in the mounds or, yeah. or something, you know, that's uh, how many stories like that, Ron, just so many of, Something to do with the Indian mounds. You think that the, some of them are there to guard? Do you? Th what do you think there? Yeah, I, I think that is absolutely the case. I think that we're talking about something spiritual as well, too. Yeah, so yeah. as you know, I was talking before, you know, I like to connect the dots. So just as the prehistoric shaman wanted to be linked to the world of the of the of the animal through spirit, so too is the spirit of these creatures uh, also protecting the culture which which really made them into deities, right? And that's what happened. Uh, and we talk about a culture that made the wolf into a deity. The first one we have to address is the Egyptian culture. And isn't it odd that the Anubis figure is actually also a guardian of the dead. It is part of the world in which it conveys the souls of the living to the afterlife as well, too. And there are artistic representations of Anubis, both with the head of a wolf, and just a regular person, as if it is capable of transforming, as if this God is capable of transforming. Um, so, yeah, it starts becoming really curious to see cultures that are, are, are vastly different, separated by thousands of years, uh, separated by thousands of miles. And they still have this same conclusion that these wolves are somehow good you know they're somehow important to these cultures and thus they become sacred uh, just to point out one more thing um in the middle ages uh even the catholic culture assumed this as well because as they were building churches uh again the, the catholicism definitely has uh you know it being halloween we forget how much paganism is in the, the catholic religion right it was formed out of 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 uh, um, a, a Near Eastern philosophy, but in order for that religion to spread, it was so vastly dependent upon the pagans and the heathens mm -hmm. to take that and spread that word. And because they came from a culture that was polytheistic, and only polytheistic, but very associated with the natural world, we see all these great elements become part of our religion as well, too. Um, St. Patrick was supposed to have um, uh, um, uh, not really chase them out, 
but subdued a cult of the werewolf in which its practitioners actually transformed into animals, right? And we have a tale from the 1200s when uh, uh, St. Francis of Assisi uh, came to a town called Gubbia in Italy uh, that was being uh, being actually predated by a wolf. Uh, it was killing livestock, then it started to kill uh, uh, humans. So St. Francis went up and started to communicate with the wolf as if this wolf was capable of knowledge and whenever that wolf died because what what saint francis said these people are going to take care of you food wise and you take care of them by being a guardian right so whenever this wolf dies they bury the wolf under the altar of the church at gubbio it bat unbaptized children weren't even buried in churchyards at this time so one of my suggestions, this is that kind of that woo that goes on. Is it possible that that wolf of Gubbio was actually one of its citizens that transformed into a werewolf? And that is the reason why St. Francis could communicate with it. And that is the reason why at death it was placed underneath the altar. I mean, that's just a the theory that's out there. Um, but if, as we move up in time as well, too, um, whenever churches were sanctified, and this goes back to the time whenever we have uh, uh, pagan temples, oftentimes a dog was killed and buried within the, within the within the cemetery area to act as a as a guard dog in the afterlife. So I'm sure there were some places in the in the in the Christian world that did this as well too, but at least it was personified in the figure of something called the black shuck which was very popular in the Middle Ages. And this was basically a, 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 a phantom black dog that would, um, you know, attack people. Uh, sometimes it was seen as the devil, but its counterpart was the church grim, which was a, 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 a dog, a wolf uh, especially, that defended the Christians from demonic spirits and they defended the dead as well too so we have all these great tells and if you start connecting the dots you can see that it makes sense in a lot of different cultures as well mute cisco mute um something you mentioned earlier too about donning the things and and you know um masquerading as the thing that we're most afraid of or that we're afraid of you know that connects right into halloween as well all the you know getting dressed up pretending to be a superhero um whatever it may be i was saying while you were you fighting the uh, like a spartan you were fighting the uh, demons of the computer to get back in here i was telling them about that's what we do when we dress up like superman or or, you know, even if it's a Pokemon for Pete's sake, if you're Charmander, you're, you you want to throw fireballs. I mean, that's just <laughs> what our, I think that's our, our, our instinct to do so. But then again, what about carving jack-o'-lanterns? Same mm -hmm. premise. They're supposed to be carved to, to uh, scare away uh, the demons and the goblins and the ghouls, you know? So mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy how all of that is, oh, I didn't mean to bang that. All is just, um, woven into the a tapestry of our culture right in the tapestry of our culture so that we look at it but we really don't understand it right even though that those threads that are making up that tapestry is all woven by us and our ancestors we're part of that tapestry right we're not excluded from it it might be something that's sacrosanct and on its own but we are part of that tapestry and until we start realizing and that we are part of something greater than just our our humanity here and now, right? We're greater than 2024, right? We 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 are we are timeless. We are eternal. And all the things that went before us, we don't exist in a vacuum. All the things that went before us makes us up to the way we are today. And all that we're doing now will make up future generations as well. So all that being said, why do we still need werewolves? Why do we still need vampires? Why do we still need Bigfoot? It's because, because they are, Ron. It's it, because they are. Right, because they right. are. And how is that different from the Native culture? And I speak on just only what I know of the Native American culture mm -hmm. here. I'm certainly no expert. But how is that different? You see what I'm saying? All of that. It just seems the human nature and nature 
and how humans interact with nature. And I'm, st I'm looking at it as, you know, uh, trying to look at it from that, um, that culture and separating everything because here it is about the werewolf. There's not a lot of weapons against the werewolf. There's right. not a lot of weapons against a shapeshifter. There's not a lot of weapons against dogman. There's not a lot of those. There's a few things. There's such as in Stephen King's Silver Bullet. You have mm -hmm. the Silver Bullet. You have uh, faith was also brought forth in that. That was definitely a strength. Um, believing in yourself, believing in whatever it is you're doing, love, the camaraderie of the group going after the monster, mm -hmm. all of those things. But outside of that, for a dog man, there's mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. There's maybe um, I've heard uh, that it definitely knows what firearms are about and it doesn't mm -hmm. like guns. So if it doesn't like them, that means it can harm them. But it better be something of a huge caliber because you had even mentioned, Ron, and I told them, too, when you were, again, wrestling with the Spartans down there, you... Um, we're in. I I wanted to learn about this because I knew very little, and I was actually surprised how much that I just took for granted. I wouldn't say I know it, but I took for granted, and it was correct. At least it goes with other theories that are out there and accepted. So I was shocked at that. I was shocked at how much it's all connected with everything else, Ron, just like mm. everything. And I was also uh, surprised to hear, like everything else, telepathic. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing a lot of this. I'm hearing a lot of this again, you know, even outside of, for lack of a better term, superpowers that I'm hearing uh, that, that could be uh, available. Your mileage may vary, as Steve Stockton says. So <laughs> it depends on what you're looking at and what your experience is. But here's the thing. I find it fascinating that we just can't realize, like I said, in cabin 22, and I don't know how much you got to listen to of that, but you could kind of see where I was taking it to where this is humans interacting with nature. That's already there. These are right. also humans that are smart enough to realize that there's a coexistence and there's no question that the, all these things are here and in existence. The, the, the only issue is what stirred it up, you know, such as like the ants get along <laughs> The black ants, the red ants get along until somebody shakes the jar kind of thing. Right. And I think that that's a good point as well, too. I think that they've always been here, but they've been suppressed. Um, I think that they are part of the natural rhythm and flow of the of, of the natural world. And we, in our infinite intelligence, have decided to step out of that, that yes. rhythm of nature that's always been there. And that is why they become monsters. Everything that is still out there that, you know, Bigfoot, you know, whatever the case may be, is part of that natural rhythm. It's part of the natural world. And we have chosen that we're not going to be part of that. And anything that is part of it, everything that we don't understand has now become a monster. Right. Right. And what about that? What about that, Ron? What about becoming the monster? What about all the things that we, and I might be taking you off your trail and I apologize no, no. if I am, but I'm so interested to see what you feel about this because it, you may not know, but I know a little secret of Ron's and I'm going to share it with you right now in front of, because nobody's listening. When asked, you know, what monster would you choose? Ron said werewolf. And I'd love to hear your reason again for that. You know, I listen to interviews, folks. <laughs> you sure do. You sure do. So the reason why I would choose werewolf is because it is rebellious, Right. I mm -hmm. don't like to follow rules. I'm not a big person okay. whenever it comes to uh, going with the flow. And the werewolf doesn't do that, right? Uh -huh. It lives by its own rules. It can do what it wants to do. It can still be an animal, right? right. I think we all kind of want to be, a, we all want to let our hair down and we all want to be that animal every now and then. But um, it allows us to do that without us being responsible for the crimes and sins we're committing while being that animal. Wow. Wow. And yeah, and that was the thing when I was a little girl, that's like the first thing that I can remember, you know, sitting cross-legged, you know, in oddly enough, Indian style. And I can still uh -huh. say that because you know, <laughs> it was okay uh -huh. to say back then. It's okay to say now. So I was sitting in front of the big Zenith watching, you know, channel 11 <laughs> on Saturday afternoon. 
we only had three channels and That's it right. might have been you know one of these gentlemen playing uh the wolfman and it was always a sad story the reluctant so whether it was the lure of uh getting bit it was always a bite was it not or a bloodline thing one mm. of the two correct and then they would change uh by the force of the full moon uh, against their will, whether they wanted to or not. And this was pretty much the lore of which this legend has been built for decades and decades and decades of this werewolf. Um, did I hit on all the, the hot points there, Rob? You did. And I think you know, this is actually a, a part of a book I think you should write. So let's take a look at the werewolf, especially in the idea of cinema as a almost a shakespearean tragic character okay. right so the werewolf you know to be to be a tragic character in yep. shakespearean literature you have to be basically a good person that is of some sort of status right and of course we see the gentleman coming back from america to claim his ancestral estate right so that's mm -hmm. one thing yes uh -huh. um you have yeah you have to have some sort of you know the hubris you know you, you have mm -hmm. to have that idea where you think that you can conquer the world and yeah. you can do things that other people can't do and then you have to have that fatal flaw the thing that's going to take you down and in the case of what makes the shakespearean uh figure uh so uh so uh um you know glaring to me is that the fatal flaw is something that is thrust upon him right mm -hmm. he was basically a good person that would have lived his life without mm -hmm. any kind of fear of retribution until something interacts with him and now he is thrust into something that he did not want to be a part of um and, and I, yeah and i think that that's something to be said uh whenever we look at, at human nature because shakespeare was a great judge of human nature and all these things have a story to tell us you know even the story of romulus and remus i know one of your uh one of your uh, uh, listeners commented upon that a while back, and uh, you know, before I I, I had to sp fight the Spartans again, and um, you know, <laughs> the idea that the, the idea that something out of nature, because in Romulus and Remus, right, his their parents reject them, right? The parents reject them and throw them into the natural world, hoping that the natural world would kill them, but instead of killing them, they accepted them as their own. And they nurtured the, the the children until they became the founders of Western civilization. So all this stuff really has a lot to be said about who we are as human beings. Uh, the other point that you made how was so How many stories silly. like that, though, Ron? I'm sorry to jump in, but how many uh, stories like that? You, the way the very Spartans uh, uh, learned to be warriors, the way mm. the Huns uh, trained, the way the military trains today and any basic training, a naval yard or, you know, uh, the the sands of uh, Biloxi, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, all of this, it, everybody, the warriors, whether they sent um, Cherokee and uh, so many other different tribes, always had this ritual of sending out um, your right of passage kind of um, into the woods, you know, for come back with um, uh, food and water or, you know, mm -hmm. stay alive anyway, you know, that right, kind of right. thing. Yeah, and that's a great point as well, too, because uh, in Arcadia, we talked about King Lycan, right? We also have something there called the Lycaon, which was a ritual rite of passage where the boys from town would get gathered together uh, and have some sort of mysterious rites under a full moon. And it was so it was so mysterious, yet so formative to the youth that Plato even wrote about this particular thing. So yeah, we have, it's a rite of passage. It's part of a culture. It, right. And we also, yeah, we're also overlooking the spiritual aspect because mm -hmm. it's just not physical. It's not all about a physical, tangible body in front of you. There's something incorporeal about these kind of creatures as well too. And we forget that the native American culture and the Egyptian culture and, and Greco, Greco Roman religions, they all saw these creatures as well as something part of the spiritual world that comes into our world as a kind of revelation. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I absolutely agree. So, we absolutely agree also on the different categories and those categories probably have subcategories, but just for, sure. for, for, you know, conversation purposes, 
uh, imagining again, you know, shape shifting. That's totally different. Whether it may be a witch that does evil deeds to to so blacken the soul that they then acquire uh, magical powers and um, abilities uh, to then go forth on the earth um, and, and cause chaos and you know mayhem. Okay, do I agree? Disagree with that? Of course I do. Listen. Mm. You know, name it across. There's 10,000 different stories like that. It just has different names, right? Anytime mm -hmm. magic and manipulating energy and powers and spelling, whether it be voodoo or or native culture in any global culture around um, you know, magic, you bring in herbs and I have newt for the love of Pete, you know, bubble, bubble, toil and trouble, right? right. There's always going to be those possibilities. But here's where I'm at with the dog. And for the last few minutes that we have you, I'd love to focus on how the werewolf is depicted in film. I would love to show you this. I, it's, a, it's just a short thing. But sure. One of the best films that I've ever seen put out there. Of course, we have to mention The Howling, probably one of the mm -hmm. first movies I ever saw on Showtime. Very well done. Um, oh, yeah. I love, of course, all the universals and the, the early times that depicted very much what you described of that reluctant, you know, against my will, you know, uh, you know, lock me in the barn kind of thing or to a tree that we always saw him chaining himself to the tree. It was just such a sad practice. And, you know, the ripping of the clothes. I always wondered, my gosh, your clothing bill, you know, why, <laughs> why, why don't you take them off first? I don't understand. Yes, <laughs> but so taking all that out. The way the transformations have always been a focus in cinema and art and the, the transforming, um, I thought very well done in the universals as, you know, as, as I had this picture here of, we see him, that was probably one of the early ones when he's laying on that couch and very slowly, of course, stop motion kind of thing where the face would uh, change and, you know, he'd get up and, you know, it would be something else. But um, I think after the howling or right before the howling, American Werewolf in London, what did you think about that whole concept? I think just looking at that one movie can tell you everything there is to know about being a werewolf and the concept and the effective. How does it affect your family, your friends, your the village that gets down to the moors? It had everything. That's right. And, you know, this was a small town. It was very religious, but they, they still relied on magic to keep the wolf at bay, right? Yeah. And then whenever yeah. it turned out, it was actually a young man, you know, who really did not want to be this beast, but it was it was thrust upon him. Uh, and, and such great special effects by Stan Winston. Um, it really is one of my, my favorite movies, uh, and, and as well as The Howling as well. But, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Think, yeah. And the, oh, I remember... Thing. The difference in it, I, I go ahead, to speak over it. It's just the difference in it, it, you know, a little bit of sparse going through some movies. Look at this. Isn't it crazy? It is. It is. And people would be uh, terrified by these. Here it is. Here it is. Is that not yeah. amazing? It is. Oh, it got us as kids, didn't it? It hooked us, didn't it, Ron? Oh, my goodness. I had a... Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, ah. I had a... I had a glow in the dark poster of Lon Chaney uh, as the Wolfman in my bedroom when I was a kid. I had the uh, the model that you glued together. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. The Wolfman. Yeah. I did. Yep. Look at this. It's the difference now with CGI. Okay, here we are. Beware the moon, Ron. Beware the moon. This was fabulously oh. done. Look at this. It's hard to watch it so good. Then you're right. Look at this. And the, the his friend showing up to talk him out of the life, turn yourself in, kill mm. yourself. And every time he showed up, he was a little more decayed. I just get, you're running out of time. You're running out of yeah. time. It was an amazing, very well done, great uh, full body uh, showing of, of the, the, you know, they, they pulled out all the stops on this one. Love the eyes, too. What do you oh, think? yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you, uh, really, I think some of the best special effects that I've ever seen, and those were practical effects. These are not CGI effects. Mm -hmm. This is somebody that's working mm -hmm. very hard to make this happen. So true, so true. And I thought I had a darn good storyline, too. Two kids backpacking across Europe, stopping the little dark pub, 
with uh, oh, the secret lore. Oh, you're going to go hiking on the moors, are you? Oh, That's you know. Good. And who doesn't love that? Just a why. You know, tell us why we shouldn't go. And of course they do. Yes, you know? that's right. That's and he right. Got bit, did he not? Did he get bit, he, attacked? Yeah, he got did yeah. So? His his friend was killed, uh, mm -hmm. and uh he was he was bitten. But um again, we see the idea that we talked about at the very beginning. We talked about whenever the contagion comes into town. Yes. If you can remember, they were drinking in a bar, and the townspeople said, you can't stay here because they were frightened if they brought a werewolf inside their town. That was their fear. So the idea of contagion was still out there. And instead of being hospitable to the strangers, they cast them back out into the wild because the you moors. cannot trust anything that's right <laughs> into the moors, which is also a place where fairies are said to, to, to dwell yep. and vampiric creatures. You know, this is the place to stay off of because it's just so dangerous. That's where that's where evil dwells oh, and yeah. evil works. Yeah. Oh, I totally forgot. Froze moment reminded me. Bad Moon Rise and playing while he changed was epic. I yes, see. that's right. Bad moon rise. And Lindsay's never seen this. You've got to go see it. And I'll tell you something else you got to see. So I'm, I'm talking real fast. I'm trying to get so much in. I just love talking to you, Ron. You just, we're just going to have to meet in Pennsylvania and just sit down and talk till we pass out. So we are. That's exactly right. I think I have a feeling it would take a couple days, but we would eventually <laughs> give, give, way, give way to sleep, I'm sure. So the, the thing with, about American Werewolf in London also was about the guy the the friend deceased coming back and decaying a little each time you're running out of time make your decision take yourself out you don't want to live this kind of life you don't want to have to kill very similar to uh interview with a vampire um i you know we when we talked about vampires we spoke on that about you know i don't want to be a vampire they were just mm -hmm. kind of sissy about it but you know of course you know eating uh, uh the, the the poodles and you know and things like that mm -hmm. it was just degrading to them but i think american werewolf in london found a different way to portray it of course this young man didn't want to take his life he was again met the nurse the young nurse now he's in love now we got mm -hmm. extra things we have to think about why now you know everything's That's so right. perfect now you know it That's has right. to be this way and it was really something else um you know, uh, I think that's another thing, like we said, we touched on it about the silver bullet. There's really not that much defense other than uh, shooting or something like that to a werewolf or the defense of turning into one. You know, you just mm -hmm. you're attacked and you're bit. That's it. Just like a mm -hmm. vampire. But they don't need to be invited. Like you said, right. they're very bestial. They're very I'm going to do what I want. I don't follow any rules. This is mm -hmm. it. Um, I think, too, touching on the one where uh, Susan Sarandon was probably the best looking uh, werewolf I ever saw, the change into that. That one was, uh, wasn't that just Wolf? Wasn't that with uh, Benicia Del Toro? Uh, that was, and, um, uh, oh, no, wait, let's see here. I think Wolf was with Jack Nicholson, right? It could have been, could have been. Was that the one that, that, yeah. that she was in? Uh, that was uh, um, a different Oh, Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah, there you go. There you go. My, Michelle Pfeiffer. Thank you. Thank you. There's been a lot. The howling. So many different ones. And I think they all lean on that. Um, again, I go to American Werewolf in London and the Silver Bullet. But the other one is the one I watched trying to prepare for this interview. And I said, I got I to gotta buck up on my dog, man, and, and stuff. That's when I started hearing all the stories about the telepa uh, telepathic and the kind of almost supernatural p powers that some of them have in the dog, man. It's an amazing uh, thing, guys. Uh, I'm telling you, again, another genre, another separation off of this. But uh, it, it, I think the sightings are multiplying uh, rapidly, I really do, of this type of dog, man where it seems yeah. to have knowledge it can open doors um i turn i get this documentary i start watching it and who pops up but mr ron murphy it's called american werewolves you can see it on uh um youtube it's fantastic and there's multiple stories there ron i told one of them that was in that documentary about the uh the man running and the thing running next to him he's by the cornfield and he He's like, I'll just turn and jump into my friend's house. And he realized he, when he runs out of cornfield, so will the dog man. 
-hmm. you know, these are spine chilling to the bone. The story about the hunter uh, with the hunting dogs. This man yeah. changed his entire lifestyle because of this. He no more. He won't go. And he was raised a, a, a hunter in these woods. He grew up here. He raised hunting dogs. It was such a big part of his life, Ron. Mm -hmm. And then That's he right. goes out and has an experience where he sends out three hunting dogs, only two come back, and it gets worse from there. Um, it does. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. You know, what is your dog man story? that made you sit down, Ron, and think before, you know, we're on our way out here and I want them to tell you, you know, where you can find you and your books and everything else. But that dog man story that made you sit down and go, we're dealing with something more here than just something natural to these woods. This is interdimensional, it's supernatural. There's something going on. What would that story be for the listeners? Well, there was a, there's an area around where I live at that is a, is a very wooded, desolate area. And there was a gentleman uh, who 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 had confided in somebody that he was a werewolf. Okay, he met a girl online. He was he moved from California to be with her. Uh, she had a small child, and he knew that he was going to be transforming soon. It had nothing to do with the moon or anything. It was some sort of chemical catalyst that happened in his body. But he knew that he was going to be transforming soon, and he was afraid that he was going to hurt the child. So he went to this very desolate area quite close to where I live right now, and he went there to transform. And he claims that whenever he transformed there, he ran into another werewolf down there, and it was a female werewolf. So the, 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 as the legend goes, this has been going on now, this is about a 30-year-old legend, that um, there's an area here in western Pennsylvania that has at least a lineage of werewolf folktales, okay? So this was an area that I was going to investigate. And uh, this was probably about uh, November uh, 21 years ago, maybe. Uh, and we were out there with, uh, was with another investigator. And uh, we were in that area. And uh, that area used to be an old uh, a place where railroad tracks went through. So the railroad tracks were now made from rails to trails. So there was only one way in and one way out. And that's the same way. So it's a very, very exclusive and uh, really tight area to investigate because you don't have to worry about any kind of contamination. So we were out on this old railroad trussel that was actually um, uh, uh, paved over. So it was now, you know, a trail. Uh, and uh, in the daytime, people would ride bikes and run there. But at night, there's nothing there whatsoever. There's no reason to be down there. There's no ambient light from any place. The nearest home is probably three miles away. So we were out there, the other investigator and I, and we start noticing that the equipment that we have is starting to be drained of batteries, uh, even though these are all fresh batteries and all those common tropes that go into uh, investigations. But what we witnessed that we had never witnessed before was all around us, it appeared as if static electricity was in the air. It looked like if you would pull off a blanket off of a bed, that kind of sparks was going on like around us. So we never noticed anything about that. And we also noticed, as I said, that there was draining of batteries going on. So we thought this might be a good time to get out of here. No evidence for a werewolf, but let's get out of here. So as we returned to leave, we turned in the trail that leads through the woods the back to our car about a mile and a half away. We see that there is a light that ignites on the path. It looks a little bit like a sparkler. It's a white light, and it kind of um, sparkles on, and it keeps on sparkling, and it stays ignited for maybe one or two seconds, and then it fades out. A very, very quick type of experience, you know, but something, again, that I never, you know, never uh, had happened to me before. So we know that unless we're going to be staying out there all night, we have to go that way where the light came on. So we very tentatively walked in that area and the light emanated from inside the woods that encircled and, and covered up the, uh, the, uh, the trail, kind of like a canopy. As soon as we get to the area where the light illuminated, we hear something off to our right following us in the woods. Um, and it was um, to the point you could hear it taking a breath every now and then. And sometimes you could hear it. You hear it growl. I mean, it, it, to, to this day, it's one of those things where I still get scared because that flight or fight response kicked in, and I knew that there's no way that I could fight it, and it was dark, and I knew there was no way to get away from it either if it wanted to take us, right? So 
I, I believe uh, whatever it was was part of that werewolf phenomenon. Uh, mm -hmm. We couldn't see anything, but we could tell. We could tell instinctually that it was on four legs, that it had those kind of, you know, predator eyes and teeth. You know, we knew that we were being stalked by something that was predatory. Um, we did make it out of there. The thing never showed itself. But I am believing that what we witnessed was an energy discharge. And whatever the energy discharge was, it allowed something to step into our environment. Whether it was a portal, whether it was an accidental earth energy that kind of sucked something up and threw it out to us or what have you. But I do believe that whatever happened that night, something stepped from some world into mm -hmm. our world. And that's mm -hmm. what we had to encounter. And if we had witnessed the thing, it would have been what we would call a werewolf. Absolutely. And so many things coming in and out of uh, what people call time uh, rips or time or portals or uh, rips vortexes and slips, yep. or all of these different things from, you know, uh, believe me, uh, that one ranch is, is not the only place that stuff like this has happened. My people have been talking about this for eons and passing along stories like this. Ron, you've been, you know, we're the new storytellers. We're the ones that are passing along stories, you know, mm -hmm. so people will pick them up and carry them on. And it, you know, I do believe in all of these things. I'm at that point now where I just want to learn more about them. But I'll tell you, the dog man thing between whether or not you're talking about the dog man or the Rougarou or whatever these new um more soldier like warrior type almost a berserker uh type mm. um dog man i I'm, think we're going to hear more about yep. it uh, you know we're yep, going to hear so. more about it they're very mm. methodical I think they, yep i think that's a good point i think they they are the berserker of the 21st century I think so. And, you know, and now you don't have all these little things like hearing it, you know, like the story in LBI, which is, you know, such an amazing story, um, you know, where they reached in and they turned the door handle and just opened the door of the RV like it was nothing. Things like that will make you cringe. You know, when when they're taunting and banging on the window or like in Cabin 22 in my story, I had them on the roof looking down and the handprints were upside down. They'd been watching the whole time from the roof, just trying to kind of uh, wrangle people and herd them where they want them to go. Um, they, they, uh, right. they hunt in packs just like Bigfoot and uh, wolves and everything yeah. else. So I don't know why it surprises us yeah. when we learn, when we learn these things, I think what really should makes our knees clatter is the when we start to realize whether it be sharks or cryptids or UFOs, we're not the top of the food chain, Ron, are we? Right, that's right, that's right, that's right. Something and, and trying to bite, get... our, bite us in the neck. Something wants us. Uh, yep, yep, and that's that's, that's that's a good point, and uh, it shows that we are still not the apex of civilization. There you go. There you go. Well, Ron, this has been absolutely wonderful. Happy Halloween to you and yours. Uh, may your whole family well, of jack o lanterns and witches under their beds and things in their closets and booze around every corner. And, you know, I just think it's wonderful. Thank you for spending this time with us. Tell us where we can find you. Everybody here loves you. We'll have you back again well, and we'll do the next subject. Yes. I, you know what? I'd like to do one on witches if you want to do witches. Absolutely. Let's do it. We're on. You're on. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do witches. Um. So uh, I. Uh, uh, it's it's a shame because it's starting to quiet down. I did a ghost tour of my area towns. I did one of Derry last week and one of Blairsville, the town that I grew up uh, uh, just uh, uh, two days ago. Uh, so uh, yeah, but I'm going to be doing a lot of lectures over the summertime. I'll be at the uh, 2024. Uh, 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 no, yeah, 2024. 25 2025 sorry about that uh bigfoot camping adventure uh coming up in september uh, i'll be at the kecksburg festival the twin lakes arts festival so the camp that uh, that's in kecksburg that is going to be uh, well you can look at uh, i'll be there with eric alban uh so you can look at the uh, big big uh, pa bigfoot society uh you can find all the details on there as well too or on facebook under ronald l murphy jr under ronald murphy either one my professional Go page or my 
Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so that's going to be there. Uh, and, and I hope people come out because it is a fantastic time where you actually get to hear a lot of speakers talk about the Bigfoot phenomenon. But yeah, so uh, I'm still writing books. Uh, you can get my books on, on Amazon, although uh, as of recently... Uh, uh, Walmart has started to carry some of my books as well too. They actually are carrying the book, my book called On Witches. So you can get them from Walmart as well too. So yeah, I, I will be around. Come, more. what's that? Here's a few more of your books okay. right here. Books by Ron Murphy. Go, you can keep talking, sweetie. You look all for right. all these books are on so many uh, different subjects. Uh, that's the next one we're doing, Ron, on witches, right? It is. It is, and I think that you'll see a lot of cool. Uh, we'll have a lot of cool things to talk about that as well, too. And then the uh, the unexplained world of the Chestnut Ridge, which is my research that I've done. A lot of good stories in there about uh, about uh, uh, werewolves, and uh, my book mm -hmm. on ghosts and vampires and all that good stuff. Derek says big ups to the crypto guru. That's right. And look, you're going to be teaching me uh, when we're talking about things like the mermaid here. And uh, I know very little on fairies. Um, I'm very interested in learning. So we're going to it's going to be a big learning. We might even make two shows out of that one. Um, yeah, the fairy ones, that, that's one of my favorite things. Yeah, one of my yeah. favorite things. I'm really interested in learning more about it. But Bigfoot, you know, that's just something. It, it's just something we've taken for granted. And yeah. Um, you know, these things in the water. I don't do water. I don't yes, get in right. water or go anywhere near it. They keep saying, but it's a big boat. And I'm like, Titanic was a big boat. What else? It was. <laughs> you know? yeah. so I'm no longer comforted by statistics. You know what I'm saying? So that's funny. There that's you go. Funny. Find all Ron's books and appearances here at the Crypto Guru on Twitter and on his Facebook uh, and Ronald Murphy, um, L. Murphy Jr., Amazon.com. Ron, I can't thank you enough for coming and spending uh, some of this uh, Halloween weekend with us and uh, sharing some of these great stories. Again, American Werewolves on YouTube. I see this uh, young man here uh, talking about uh, dogmen. Wonderful, wonderful stories and firsthand accounts of uh, seeing the dogmen. It's uh, free on YouTube. I highly recommend it. Ron, thank you so much for this. I conference. love you, Cisco. Thanks a lot for having me. And I'm sorry I about those goblins at the beginning. We'll see you guys soon. It's fine. Love you, baby. Thank you so much. Happy Halloween. Thank Happy you. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Bye, sweetheart. Bye. There we go. Ron Murphy, everybody. Grab those books. Um, it's wonderful to talk to him. Uh, man does so much research, so much knowledge. And everybody, you know, it's always wonderful to have him here. And, um, uh, the uh, wonderful episodes, if you have not seen them, uh, we did on vampires. Uh, that was so much fun because, gosh, you've got the vampires and the lore and you've got, you know, the, all the movies on Dracula and the films and, uh, you know, so much about it. And then uh, we also did, uh, oh, Bigfoot, uh, more than just Big Feet and uh, that was a wonderful double header. We had Ron uh, the first hour and then we did Brian Bowden on the second hour. So thank you guys so much for being so kind to Ron. I love it when I have my friends on here and y'all are so chill and, and, you know, um, the good questions and good comments and things like that. Um, and we tried to get a little bit, it's such a big subject. We really should have probably broken into two. Um, but I also know that Ron has to get up very early and, are you Scottish too? I am uh, from the McFarlands. Uh, we, we are Murdochs. And uh, yeah, I set up my, uh, my uh, tarp and everything. It's something else. Lots of, uh, I think it's really pretty. I love the um, the dress one. My brother has a lovely kilt done in the, um, the one that you would wear to special occasions and, and things like that for your clan. And um, it's absolutely beautiful. I love the, uh, the plaid on it. It's, it's really, really uh, quite something. It's funny how I think about it, native American and Scottish, but once you start looking at the clans and the, the tribal and the, um, the, the way um, the village um, mindset and uh, the characteristics of, you know, everybody using their, their talents and their, um, you know, what they're good at to help the entire tribe and the whole village. I mean, it's the same. It's the same, you know, and uh, loincloth kilt, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it's funny how much, and like I said, the cultures um, and everybody, um, you know, everything's lost in translation and they don't realize how, 
you know, they're all just trying to survive and get food and clean water and nobody wants to be sick. And we don't want you to, you know, kill all the nature because everybody will die. And, you know, you can't do that here because this will happen. And you can't dam up the, the river because all the fish will die and the people down river don't get water. You know, common sense things, you know, you can't use it all because there won't be any more. How, how simple is that? You know, so anyhow. I've been one, you know, that Halloween has been fantastic. Uh, I kind of started on this channel in like September, uh, making all kinds of Halloween videos and music videos and Halloween this and scary movie that and all this other stuff. And we've done uh, murder mysteries. We've done several of the C CBS murder mysteries and old radio shows together. We've had a blast in live chat talking about them. And it's like, look out, Helen, you know, <laughs> get a get a poker you know whatever don't let them at you don't let them get get you cornered you know that kind of stuff we've solved all kind of ghost uh haunting mysteries and things like that all this halloween we've had treat bags and uh halloween ghost stories and and, and things like that you got krampus next week. we didn't do any krampus that's right we didn't froze so i thought what could i do i knew ron was going to have to leave early and i said what could i do as a filler um, for this show that that really is uh, spectacular and would be kind of cool for you guys too and I thought you know there's got to be a story there's got to be a legend there's got to be a see we did the raven we did um a ground poles the raven and that was really fun a lot of cool visuals with that and we did some other stuff you know which one we hadn't done besides Krampus guess which one we hadn't done Kind of famous. I would say very famous. Had several different major motion pictures starting in 1932, I would think was the first one. <laughs> no Wampus Cats. Close, but no cigar. Um, it had, yeah. I had a film done in 1934, several others, and then a large company that was really dealing in a lot of hand-drawn um, stop-motion uh, stop motion pictures done on what they call gel. So a lot of these hand-drawn, took a lot of talent, had a very famous room full of these very talented um, artists. I used to hand draw these movies. Who was that? We did a show. Oh, Halloween trivia. We did a show not long ago on a certain year. And it was 1923. And we talked about all the different things that happened in 1923. And on that, in that year, a very specific uh, duo, two brothers, went and uh, opened up a little film studio. And their big thing was advertisement. And then they started getting into this stop, not clay figure and, and stop motion that way, but the stop motion where you draw uh, multiple different uh, layers of this one scene and you play them together very fast, very much like the little circles that used to go around. You could see the guy riding the horse it went really faster if you do a flip a bunch of cards and you flip them together well but it wasn't warner cherokee yep cherokee and lenape we're also called the delaware a flip book yep that's right we're also called delaware indians because they i guess they couldn't say lenny lenape you know that's okay they they named a couple of roads at a motel after us it's all it's all good, folks. There's a couple things here left, and the rest of us went on to Oklahoma. So from New Jersey to Oklahoma, you know, we had to move that far away. Strange, isn't it? So anyway, it was, I had a couple major films. So these two brothers started a studio in California in 1923. Who was it? They majored, they started in advertising, and then they started to do cartoon strips. And then they thought, okay, we're going to do, see if we could put out shorts 
a cartoon and um, maybe mix that cartoon with live action people. And the first one they did like that was Alice in Wonderland. Who was it? <laughs> yep. So y'all are going to be getting it here pretty quick. So they did. They put out um, a couple of, well, they put out a cartoon version of this story. But there was something that went on in the artist room because there was like a little, like a, a, a little disagreement or something. And the guy who was the main artist for this went off and kind of started his own thing and then wound up coming back. So there was another short cartoon that was called had something to do with the toad and yep Walt Disney and his brother Vixen that's right so they did a version of this story early but it didn't get released because there was a problem with the, in the Disney uh compound so the artist that was doing the drawing he pulled out took his stuff with him made another movie he wound up going back to Disney and Disney wound up buying the rights to that movie so they'd have all of it. So that's basically the short version. So what is that Halloween story that I've never told here? We've never shared it here. Um, I've never done a, a radio mystery on it or anything like that. Like I said, we did the Raven Edgar Allan Poe and we did some other ones. We did some other uh, poetry and stuff like that for Halloween. I can't believe we missed that. This one. Can you name what it is? I bet you Vixen will get it. What Halloween story have we not told? Well, we're going to tell it tonight. Happy Halloween, y'all. If you want to stick around for the next <laughs> for the next little bit, we might do half of it tonight, half of it tomorrow night after Steve. But uh, who wants to stick around and hear a little bit of this? Of Sleepy Hollow. By Washington Irving Found among the papers of the late Dietrich Knickerbocker Happy Halloween, y'all. Now this is from LibriVox. It is a young man who is known only by Chip. And he does an absolutely wonderful job reading Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. So it's about an hour twenty. I think maybe we'll play half of it tonight, maybe half of it tomorrow. But uh, it's for your Halloween weekend, and it's just a little extra. So enjoy. Found among the papers of the late Dietrich Knickerbocker. A pleasing land of drowsy head it was, of dreams that wave before the half-shut eye, and of gay castles in the clouds that pass, forever flushing round a summer sky. From Castle of Indolence. In the bosom of one of those spacious coves which indent the eastern shore of the Hudson at that broad expansion of the river denominated by the ancient Dutch navigators the Tappan Zee, and where they always prudently shortened sail and implored the protection of St. Nicholas when they crossed, there lies a small market-town or rural port, which by some is called Greensburg, but which is more generally and properly known by the name of Tarrytown. This name was given, we are told, in former days by the good housewives of the adjacent country, from the inveterate propensity of their husbands to linger about the village tavern on market-days. Be that as it may, I do not vouch for the fact, but merely advert to it, for the sake of being precise and authentic. Not far from this village, perhaps about two miles, there is a little valley, or rather lap of land among high hills, which is one of the quietest places in the whole world. A small brook glides through it, with just murmur enough to lull one into repose and the occasional whistle of a quail or tapping of a woodpecker is almost the only sound that ever breaks in upon the uniform tranquillity. 
I recollect that when a stripling my first exploit in squirrel shooting was in a grove of tall walnut trees that shades one side of the valley. I had wandered into it at noontime when all nature is peculiarly quiet, and was startled by the roar of my own gun as it broke the Sabbath stillness around and was prolonged and reverberated by the angry echoes. If ever I should wish for a retreat whither I might steal from the world and its distractions and dream quietly away the remnant of a troubled life, I know of none more promising than this little valley. From the listless repose of the place and the peculiar character of its inhabitants, who are descendants from the original Dutch settlers, this sequestered glen has long been known by the name of Sleepy Hollow and its rustic lads are called the Sleepy Hollow Boys throughout all the neighboring country. A drowsy, dreamy influence seems to hang over the land, and to pervade the very atmosphere. Some say that the place was bewitched by a high German doctor during the early days of the settlement, others that an old Indian chief, the prophet or wizard of his tribe, held his powwows there before the country was discovered by Master Henrik Hudson. Certain it is that the place still continues under the sway of some witching power that holds a spell over the minds of the good people, causing them to walk in a continual reverie. They are given to all kinds of marvelous beliefs, are subject to trances and visions, and frequently see strange sights and hear music and voices in the air. The whole neighborhood abounds with local tales, haunted spots and twilight superstitions. Stars shoot and meteors glare oftener across the valley than in any other part of the country, and the nightmare, with her whole ninefold, seems to make it the favorite scene of her gambols. The dominant spirit, however, that haunts this enchanted region and seems to be commander-in-chief of all the powers of the air is the apparition of a figure on horseback without a head. It is said by some to be the ghost of a Hessian trooper, whose head had been carried away by a cannonball in some nameless battle during the Revolutionary War, and who is ever and anon seen by the country folk hurrying along in the gloom of night as if on the wings of the wind. His haunts are not confined to the valley, but extend at times to the adjacent roads, and especially to the vicinity of a church at no great distance. Indeed, certain of the most authentic historians of these parts, who have been careful in collecting and collating the floating facts concerning this spectre, allege that the body of the trooper, having been buried in the churchyard, the ghost rides forth to the scene of battle in nightly quest of his head and that the rushing speed with which he sometimes passes along the hollow, like a midnight blast, is owing to his being belated and in a hurry to get back to the churchyard before daybreak. Such is the general purport of this legendary superstition, which has furnished materials for many a wild story in that region of shadows, and the spectre is known at all the country firesides by the name of the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow. It is remarkable that the visionary propensity I have mentioned is not confined to the native inhabitants of the valley, but is unconsciously imbibed by every one who resides there for a time. However wide awake they may have been before they entered that sleepy region, they are sure in a little time to inhale the witching influence of the air, and begin to grow imaginative, to dream dreams, to see apparitions. I mention this peaceful spot with all possible laud, for it is in such little retired Dutch valleys, found here and there embosomed in the great state of New York, that population, manners, and customs remain fixed, while the great torrent of migration and improvement, which is making such incessant changes in other parts of this restless country, sweeps by them unobserved. 
They are like those little nooks of still water which border a rapid stream, where we may see the straw and bubble riding quietly at anchor, or slowly revolving in their mimic harbor, undisturbed by the rush of the passing current. Though many years have elapsed since I trod the drowsy shades of Sleepy Hollow, yet I question whether I should not still find the same trees and the same families vegetating in its sheltered bosom. In this by-place of nature there abode in a remote period of American history, that is to say some thirty years since, a worthy white of the name of Ichabod Crane, who sojourned, or, as he expressed it, tarried in Sleepy Hollow, for the purpose of instructing the children of the vicinity. He was a native of Connecticut, a state which supplies the Union with pioneers for the mind as well as for the forest, and sends forth yearly its legions of frontier woodmen and country schoolmasters. The cognomen of Crane was not inapplicable to his person. He was tall, but exceedingly lank, with narrow shoulders, long arms and legs, hands that dangled a mile out of his sleeves, feet that might have served for shovels, and his whole frame most loosely hung together. His head was small and flat at top, with huge ears, large green glassy eyes, and a long snipe nose, so that it looked like a weathercock perched atop his spindle neck, to tell which way the wind blew. To see him striding along the profile of a hill on a windy day, with his clothes bagging and fluttering about him, one might have mistaken him for the genius of famine descending upon the earth or some scarecrow eloped from a cornfield. His schoolhouse was a low building of one large room, rudely constructed of logs, the windows partly glazed and partly patched with leaves of old copy-books. It was most ingeniously secured at vacant hours by a withe twisted in the handle of the door, and stakes set against the window shutters, so that, though a thief might get in with perfect ease, he would find some embarrassment in getting out, an idea most probably borrowed by the architect, Jost van Houten, from the mystery of an eel-pot. The schoolhouse stood in a rather lonely but pleasant situation, just at the foot of a woody hill with a brook running close by, and a formidable birch-tree growing at one end of it. From hence the low murmur of his pupils' voices, conning over their lessons, might be heard on a drowsy summer's day, like the hum of a beehive, interrupted now and then by the authoritative voice of the master, in the tone of menace or command, or peradventure by the appalling sound of the birch, as he urged some tardy loiterer along the flowery path of knowledge. Truth to say, he was a conscientious man, and ever bore in mind the golden maxim, Spare the rod, and spoil the child. Ichabod Crane's scholars certainly were not spoiled. I would not have it imagined, however, that he was one of those cruel potentates of the school who joy in the smart of their subjects. On the contrary, he administered justice with discrimination rather than severity, taking the burden off the backs of the weak, and laying it on those of the strong. Your mere puny stripling, that winced at the least flourish of the rod, was passed by with indulgence, but the claims of justice were satisfied by inflicting a double portion on some little tough, wrong-headed, broad-skirted Dutch urchin, who sulked and swelled and grew dogged and sullen beneath the birch. All this he called doing his duty by their parents, and he never inflicted a chastisement without following it by the assurance, so consolatory to the smarting urchin, that he would remember it and thank him for it the longest day he had to live. When school hours were over, he was even the companion and playmate of the larger boys, and on holiday afternoons would convoy some of the smaller ones home, who happened to have pretty sisters or good housewives for mothers, noted for the comforts of their cupboard. Indeed, it behooved him to keep on good terms with his pupils. The revenue arising from his school was small, and would have been scarcely sufficient to furnish him with the daily bread, 
for he was a huge feeder, and though lank he had the dilating powers of an anaconda, but to help out his maintenance he was, according to country custom in those parts, boarded and lodged at the houses of the farmers whose children he instructed. With these he lived successively a week at a time, thus going the rounds of the neighborhood with all his worldly effects tied up in a cotton handkerchief. That all this might not be too onerous on the purses of his rustic patrons, who are apt to consider the costs of schooling a grievous burden, and schoolmasters as mere drones, he had various ways of rendering himself both useful and agreeable. He assisted the farmers occasionally in the lighter labors of their farms, helped to make hay, mended the fences, took the horses to water, drove the cows from pasture, and cut wood for the winter fire. He laid aside, too, all the dominant dignity and absolute sway with which he lorded it in his little empire, the school, and became wonderfully gentle and ingratiating. He found favor in the eyes of the mothers by petting the children, particularly the youngest, and, like the lion bold, which will whom so magnanimously the lamb did hold, he would sit with a child upon one knee, and rock a cradle with his foot for hours together. In addition to his other vocations, he was the singing-master of the neighborhood, and picked up many bright shillings by instructing the young folks in psalmody. It was a matter of no little vanity to him on Sundays to take his station in front of the church gallery with a band of chosen singers, where, in his own mind, he completely carried away the palm from the parson. Certain it is, his voice resounded far above all the rest of the congregation, and there are particular quavers still to be heard in that church, and which may even be heard half-mile off, quite to the opposite side of the mill-pond on a still Sunday morning, which are said to be legitimately descended from the nose of Ichabod Crane. Thus, by divers little makeshifts, and in that ingenious way which is commonly denominated by hook and by crook, the worthy pedagogue got on tolerably enough, and was thought by all who understood nothing of the labor of headwork to have a wonderfully easy life of it. The schoolmaster is generally a man of some importance in the female circle of a rural neighborhood, being considered a kind of idle, gentlemanly personage, of vastly superior taste and accomplishments to the rough country swains, and, indeed, inferior in learning only to the parson. His appearance, therefore, is apt to occasion some little stir at the tea-table of a farmhouse and the addition of a supernumerary dish of cakes or sweetmeats, or peradventure the parade of a silver teapot. Our man of letters, therefore, was peculiarly happy in the smiles of all the country damsels. How he would figure among them in the churchyard between services on Sundays, gathering grapes for them in the wild vines that overran the surrounding trees, reciting for their amusement all the epitaphs on the tombstones, or sauntering with a whole bevy of them along the banks of the adjacent mill-pond, while the more bashful country bumpkins hung sheepishly back, envying his superior elegance and address. From his half-itinerant life also he was a kind of travelling gazette, carrying the whole budget of local gossip from house to house, so that his appearance was always greeted with satisfaction. He was, moreover, esteemed by the women as a man of great erudition, for he had read several books quite through, and was the perfect master of Cotton Mather's History of New England Witchcraft, in which, by the way, he most firmly and potently believed. He was, in fact, an odd mixture of shrewdness and simple credulity. His appetite for the marvellous, and his powers of digesting it, were equally extraordinary, and both had been increased by his residence in this spellbound region. 
No tail was too gross or monstrous for this capricious swallow. It was often his delight, after his school was dismissed in the afternoon, to stretch himself on the rich bed of clover bordering the little brook that whimpered by his schoolhouse, and there con over old Mather's direful tales, until the gathering dusk of evening made the printed page a mere mist before his eyes. Then, as he wended his way by swamp and stream and awful woodland to the farmhouse where he happened to be quartered, every sound of nature at that witching hour fluttered and excited imagination. The moan of the whippoorwill from the hillside, the boding cry of the tree-toad, that harbinger of storm, the dreary hooting of the screech-owl, or the sudden rustling in the thicket of birds frightened from their roost. The fireflies, too, which sparkled most vividly in the darkest place, now and then startled him, as one of uncommon brightness would stream across his path, and if, by chance, a huge blockhead of a beetle came winging his blundering flight against him, the poor varlet was ready to give up the ghost, with the idea that he was struck with a witch's token. His only resource on such occasions, either to drown thought or drive away evil spirits, was to sing psalm tunes, and the good people of Sleepy Hollow, as they sat by their doors of an evening, were often filled with awe at hearing his nasal melody, in linked sweetness long drawn out, floating from the distant hill or along the dusky road. Another of his sources of fearful pleasure was to pass long winter evenings with the old Dutch wives as they sat spinning by the fire, with a row of apples roasting and spluttering along the hearth, and to listen to their marvellous tales of ghosts and goblins and haunted fields and haunted brooks and haunted bridges and haunted houses and particularly of the headless horseman, or galloping hessian of the hollow, as they sometimes called him. He would delight them equally by his anecdotes of witchcraft, and of the direful omens and portentous sights and sounds in the air, which prevailed in the earlier times of Connecticut, and would frighten them woefully with speculations upon comets and shooting stars, and with the alarming fact that the world did absolutely turn around, and that they were half the time topsy-turvy. But if there were a pleasure in all this, while snuggling, cuddling in the chimney-corner of a chamber that was all of a ruddy glow from the crackling wood-fire, and where, of course, no spectre dared to show its face, it was dearly purchased by the terrors of his subsequent walk homeward. What fearful shapes and shadows beset this path, amid the dim and ghastly glare of a snowy night! With what wistful look did he eye every trembling ray of light streaming across the waste fields from some distant window? How often was he appalled by some shrub covered with snow, which, like a sheeted spectre, beset his very path? How often did he shrink with curdling awe at the sound of his own steps on the frosty crust beneath his feet? and dread to look over his shoulder, lest he should behold some uncouth being tramping close behind him. And how often was he thrown into complete dismay by some rushing blast, howling among the trees, in the idea that it was the galloping hessian of one of his nightly scourings. All these, however, were mere terrors of the night, phantoms of the mind that walk in darkness. And though he had seen many spectres in his time, and had been more than once beset by Satan in divers shapes in his lonely perambulations, yet daylight put an end to all these evils, and he would have passed a pleasant life of it, in spite of the devil and all his works, if his path had not been crossed by a being that causes more perplexity to mortal man than ghosts, goblins, and the whole race of witches put together, and that was a woman. 
Among the musical disciples who assembled one evening each week to receive his instructions in psalmody was Katrina van Tassel, the daughter and only child of a substantial Dutch farmer. She was a blooming lass of fresh eighteen, plump as a partridge, ripe and melting and rosy-cheeked as one of her father's peaches, and universally famed not merely for her beauty, but her vast expectations. She was, withal, a little of a coquette, as might be perceived even in her dress, which was a mixture of ancient and modern fashions, as most suited to set off her charms. She wore the ornaments of pure yellow gold which her great-great-grandmother had brought over from Sardam, the tempting stomacher of the olden time, and withal a provokingly short petticoat to display the prettiest foot and ankle in the country round. Bod Crane had a soft and foolish heart towards the sex, and it is not to be wondered that so tempting a morsel soon found favor in his eyes, more especially after he had visited her in her paternal mansion. Old Baltus von Tassel was a perfect picture of a thriving, contented, liberal-hearted farmer. He seldom, it is true, sent either his eyes or his thoughts beyond the boundaries of his own farm, but within those everything was snug, happy, and well-conditioned. He was satisfied with his wealth, but not proud of it, and piqued himself upon the hearty abundance rather than the style in which he lived. His stronghold was situated on the banks of the Hudson, in one of those green, sheltered, fertile nooks in which the Dutch farmers are so fond of nestling. A great elm-tree had spread its broad branches over it, at the foot of which bubbled up a spring of the softest and sweetest water in a little well formed of a barrel, and then stole sparkling away through the grass to a neighboring brook that babbled among the alders and dwarf willows. Hard by the farmhouse was a vast barn that might have served for a church, every window and crevice of which seemed bursting forth with the treasures of the farm. The flail was busily resounding within it from morning till night. Swallows and martins skimmed, twittering about the eaves, and rows of pigeons, some with one eye turned up as if watching the weather, some with their heads under their wings or buried in their bosoms, and others swelling and cooing and bowing about their dames, were enjoying the sunshine on the roof. Sleek, unwieldy porkers were grunting in the repose and abundance of their pens, from which sallied forth now and then troops of sucking pigs as if to snuff the air. A stately squadron of snowy geese were riding in an adjoining pond, convoying whole fleets of ducks. Regiments of turkeys were gobbling through the farmyard, and guinea-fowls fretting about it, like ill-tempered housewives with their peevish, discontented cry. Before the barn door strutted the gallant cock, that pattern of a husband, a warrior, and a fine gentleman, clapping his burnished wings and crowing in the pride and gladness of his heart, sometimes tearing up the earth with his feet, and then generously calling his ever-hungry family of wives and children to enjoy the rich morsel which he had discovered. The pedagogue's mouth watered as he looked upon this sumptuous promise of luxurious winter fare. In his devouring mind's eye he pictured to himself every roasting pig running about with a pudding in his belly and an apple in his mouth. The pigeons were snugly put to bed in a comfortable pie, and tucked in with a coverlet of crust. The geese were swimming in their own gravy, and the ducks pairing cosily in dishes, like snug married couples with a decent competency of onion sauce. In the porkers he saw carved out the future sleek side of bacon, and juicy relishing ham. Not a turkey, but he beheld daintily trussed up with its gizzard under its wing, and peradventure a necklace of savory sausages, and even bright Chanticleer himself lay sprawling on his back in a side-dish, with uplifted claws as if craving that quarter which his chivalrous spirit disdained to ask while living.
As the enraptured Ichabod fancied all this, and as he rolled his great green eyes over the fat meadow lands, the rich fields of wheat, of rye, of buckwheat, and Indian corn, and the orchards burdened with ruddy fruit which surrounded the warm tenement of Van Tassel, his heart yearned after the damsel who was to inherit these domains, and his imagination expanded with the idea how they might be readily turned into cash, and the money invested in immense tracts of wild land and shingle palaces in the wilderness. Nay, his busy fancy already realized his hopes, and presented to him the blooming Katrina, with a whole family of children, mounted on top of the wagon, loaded with household trumpery, with pots and kettles dangling beneath, and he beheld himself astride a pacing mare, with a colt at her heels, setting out for Kentucky, Tennessee, or the Lord knows where. When he entered the house, the conquest of his heart was complete. It was one of those spacious farmhouses with high-ridged but lowly sloping roofs, built in the style handed down from the first Dutch settlers, the low projecting eaves forming a piazza along the front, capable of being closed up in bad weather. Under this were hung flails, harness, various utensils of husbandry, and nets for fishing in the neighboring river. Benches were built along the sides for summer use, and a great spinning-wheel at one end, and a churn at the other, showed the various uses to which this important porch might be devoted. From this piazza the wandering Ichabod entered the hall which formed the center of the mansion, and the place of usual residence. Here rose a resplendent pewter, ranged on a long dresser, dazzled his eyes. In one corner hung a huge bag of wool ready to be spun, in another a quantity of linsey woolsey just from the loom. Ears of Indian corn and strings of dried apples and peaches hung in gay festoons along the walls, mingled with the gaud of red peppers, and a door left ajar gave him a peep into the best parlor where the claw-footed chairs and dark mahogany tables shone like mirrors, and irons with their accompanying shovel and tongs glistened from their covert of asparagus tops. Mock oranges and conch shells decorated the mantelpiece. Strings of various colored bird eggs were suspended above it. A great ostrich egg was hung from the center of the room, and a corner cupboard, knowingly left open, displayed immense treasures of old silver and well-mended china. From the moment Ichabod laid his eyes upon these regions of delight, the peace of his mind was at an end, and his only study was how to gain the affections of the peerless daughter of Van Tassel. In this enterprise, however, he had more real difficulties than generally fell to the lot of a knight-errant of yore, who seldom had anything but giants and chatters, fiery dragons, and such like easily conquered adversaries to contend with, and had to make his way merely through gates of iron and brass, and walls of adamant to the castle keep, where the lady of his heart was confined all of which he achieved as easily as a man would carve his way to the center of a Christmas pie. And then the lady gave him her hand as a matter of course. Ichabod, on the contrary, had to win his way to the heart of a country coquette, beset with a labyrinth of whims and caprices, which were forever presenting new difficulties and impediments, and he had to encounter a host of fearful adversaries, of real flesh and blood, the numerous rustic admirers who beset every portal to her heart, keeping a watchful and angry eye upon each other, but ready to fly out in common cause against any new competitor. Among these, the most formidable was a burly, roaring, roistering blade of the name of Abraham, or, according to the Dutch abbreviation, Brom van Brunt the hero of the country round, which rang with his feats of strength and hardihood. He was broad-shouldered and double-jointed, with short, curly black hair and a bluff, 
but not unpleasant countenance, having a mingled air of fun and arrogance. From his Herculean frame and great powers of limb he had received the nickname Brom Bones, by which he was universally known. He was famed for great knowledge and skill in horsemanship, being as dexterous on horseback as a tartar. He was foremost at all races and cockfights, and with the ascendancy which bodily strength always acquires in rustic life, he was the umpire in all disputes, setting his hat on one side and giving his decisions with an air and tone that admitted to no gainsay or appeal. He was always ready for either a fight or a frolic, but had more mischief than ill-will in his composition, and with all his overbearing roughness there was a strong dash of waggish good humor at bottom. He had three or four boon companions who regarded him as their model, and at the head of whom he scoured the country, attending every scene of feud or merriment for miles around. In cold weather he was distinguished by a fur cap, surmounted with a flaunting fox's tail, and, when the folks at a country gathering descried this well-known crest at a distance, whisking about among the squad of hard riders, they always stood by for a squall. Sometimes his crew would be heard dashing along past farmhouses at midnight, with whoop and halloo like a troop of Don Cossacks, and the old dames, startled out of their sleep, would listen for a moment, till the hurry-scurry had clattered by, and then exclaimed, "'Aye, there goes Brom Bones and his gang!' The neighbors looked upon him with a mixture of awe, admiration, and good will, and when any madcap prank or rustic brawl occurred in the vicinity, they always shook their heads, and warranted Brom Bones was at the bottom of it. This Rantipole hero had for some time singled out the blooming Katrina for the object of his uncouth gallantries, and though his amorous toyings were something like the gentle caresses and endearments of a bear, yet it was whispered that she did not altogether discourage his hopes. Certain it is, his advances were signals for rival candidates to retire, who felt no inclination to cross a lion in his amours insomuch that when his horse was seen tied to Van Tassel's paling on a Sunday night, a sure sign that his master was courting, or, as it is termed, sparking within, all other suitors passed by in despair, and carried the war to other quarters. Such was the formidable rival with whom Ichabod Crane had to contend, and, Considering all things, a stouter man than he would have shrunk from the competition, and a wiser man would have despaired. He had, however, a happy mixture of pliability and perseverance in his nature. He was in form and spirit like a supple jack, yielding but tough. Though he bent, he never broke, and though he bowed beneath the slightest pressure, yet, the moment it was away, jerk he was erect and carried his head as high as ever. To have taken the field openly against his rival would have been madness, for he was not a man to be thwarted in his amours any more than that stormy lover Achilles. Ichabod, therefore, made his advances in a quiet and gently insinuating manner. Under cover of his character of singing-master he made frequent visits at the farmhouse, not that he had anything to apprehend from the meddlesome interference of parents, which is so often a stumbling-block in the path of lovers. Balt van Tassel was an easy, indulgent soul. He loved his daughter better than his pipe, and, like a reasonable man and an excellent father, let her have her way in everything. His notable little wife, too, had enough to do to attend to her housekeeping and manage her poultry, for, as she sagely observed, Ducks and geese are foolish things, and must be looked after, but girls can take care of themselves. Thus, while the busy dame bustled about the house, or plied her spinning wheel at the one end of the piazza, honest Balt would sit smoking his pipe at the other, watching the achievements of a little wooden warrior, who, armed with a sword in each hand, was most valiantly fighting in the wind in the pinnacle of the barn. In the meantime, 
Ichabod would carry on his suit with the daughter by the side of the spring under the great elm, or sauntering along in the twilight, that hour so favorable to the lover's eloquence. I profess not to know how women's hearts are wooed and won. To me they have always been matters of riddle and admiration. Some seem to have but one vulnerable point or door of access, while others have a thousand avenues, and may be captured in a thousand different ways. It is a great triumph of skill to gain the former, but a still greater proof of generalship to maintain possession of the latter, for a man must battle for his fortress at every door and window. He who wins a thousand common hearts is therefore entitled to some renown, but he who keeps undisputed sway over the heart of a coquette is indeed a hero. Certain it is, this was not the case with the redoubtable Brom Bones, and from the moment Ichabod Crane made his advances, the interests of the former evidently declined. His horse was no longer seen tied to the palings on Saturday nights, and a deadly feud gradually arose between him and the preceptor of Sleepy Hollow. Brom, who had a degree of rough chivalry in his nature, would fain have carried matters to open warfare and have settled their pretensions to the lady, according to the mode of those most concise and simple reasoners, the knights errant of yore, by single combat, but Ichabod was too conscious of the superior might of his adversary to enter the lists against him. He had overheard a boast of bones that he would double the schoolmaster up and lay him on a shelf of his own schoolhouse, and he was too wary to give him an opportunity. There was something extremely provoking in this obstinately pacific system. It left Brahm no alternative but to draw upon the funds of rustic waggery in his disposition, and to play off boorish practical jokes upon his rival. Ichabod became the object of whimsical persecution to Bones and his gang of rough riders. They harried his hitherto peaceful domains, smoked out the singing school by stopping up the chimney, broke into the schoolhouse at night in spite of its formidable fastenings of withe and window stakes, and turned everything topsy-turvy so that the poor schoolmaster began to think all the witches in the country held their meetings there. But what was still more annoying, Brom took all the opportunities of turning him into ridicule in the presence of his mistress, and a scoundrel dog whom he taught to whine in the most ludicrous manner, and introduced as a rival of Ichabod's to instruct her in psalmody. In this way matters went on for some time without producing any material effect on the relative situations of the contending powers. On a fine autumnal afternoon, Ichabod, in pensive mood, sat enthroned on the lofty stool from whence he usually watched all the concerns of his little literary realm. In his hand he swayed a ferule, that scepter of despotic power, the birch of justice, reposed on three nails behind the throne, a constant terror to evildoers, while on the desk before him might be seen sundry contraband articles and prohibited weapons detected upon the persons of idle urchins, such as half-munched apples, pop-guns, whirligigs, fly-cages, and whole legions of rampant little paper gamecocks. Apparently there had been some appalling act of justice recently inflicted, for his scholars were all busily intent upon their books, or slyly whispering behind them with what I kept on the master, and a kind of buzzing stillness reigned throughout the schoolroom. He came clattering up to the school with an invitation to Ichabod to attend a merrymaking or quilting frolic to be held that afternoon at Mynheer van Tassel's. He dashed over the brook, and was seen scampering away up the hollow, full of the importance and hurry of his mission. 
All was now bustle and hubbub in the late quiet schoolroom. The scholars were hurried through their lessons without stopping at trifles. Those who were nimble skipped over half with impunity, and those who were tardy had a smart application now and then in the rear to quicken their speed or help them over a tall word. Books were flung aside without being put away on the shelves, inkstands were overturned, benches thrown down, and the whole school was turned loose, an hour before the usual time, bursting forth like a legion of young imps, yelping and racketing about the green in joy at their early emancipation. The gallant Ichapod now spent at least an extra half-hour at his toilets, brushing and furbishing up his best, and indeed only suit of rusty black, and arranging his locks by a bit of broken looking-glass that hung up in the schoolhouse. That he might make his appearance before his mistress in the true style of a cavalier, he borrowed a horse from the farmer with whom he was domiciliated, a choleric old Dutchman of the name of Hans van Ripper, and thus gallantly mounted, issued forth like a knight-errant in quest of adventures. But it is meet I should, in the true spirit of romantic story, give some account of the looks and equipments of my hero and his steed. The animal he bestrode was a broken-down plough-horse that had outlived almost everything but its viciousness. He was gaunt and shagged with a ewe-neck and a head like a hammer. His rusty mane and tail were tangled and knotted with burrs. One eye had lost its pupil and was glaring and spectral, but the other had the gleam of a genuine devil in it. Still, he must have had fire and metal in his day, if we may judge from the name he bore of Gunpowder. He had, in fact, been a favorite steed of his master's, the choleric Van Ripper, who was a furious rider, and had infused, very probably, some of his own spirit into the animal, for, old and broken down as he looked, there was more of the lurking devil in him than in any young filly in the country. Ichabod was a suitable figure for such a steed. He rode with short stirrups, which brought his knees nearly up to the pommel of his saddle. His sharp elbows stuck out like grasshoppers. He carried his whip perpendicularly in his hand like a scepter, and, as his horse jogged on, the motion of his arms was not unlike the flapping of a pair of wings. A small wool hat rested at the top of his nose, for so his scanty strip of forehead might be called, and the skirts of his black coat fluttered out almost to the horse's tail. Such was the appearance of Ichabod and his steed as they shambled out of the gate of Hans van Ripper, and it was altogether such an apparition as is seldom to be met with in broad daylight. It was, as I have said, a fine autumnal day. The sky was very clear and serene, and nature wore that rich and golden livery which we always associate with the idea of abundance. The forests had put on their sober brown and yellow, while some trees of the tenderer kind had been nipped by the frosts into brilliant dyes of orange, purple, and scarlet. Streaming files of wild ducks began to make their appearance high in the air. The bark of the squirrel might be heard from the groves of beech and hickory nuts, and the pensive whistle of the quail at intervals from the neighboring stubble field. The small birds were taking their farewell banquets. In the fullness of their revelry they fluttered, chirping and frolicking from bush to bush and tree to tree, capricious from the very profusion and variety around them. There was the honest cock-robin, the favorite game of stripling sportsmen, with its loud, querulous note, and the twittering blackbirds flying in sable clouds, and the golden-winged woodpecker with his crimson crest, his broad black gorget and splendid plumage, and the cedar-bird with its red-tipped wings and yellow-tipped tail in its little Montiero cap of feathers, and the blue jay, that noisy coxcomb, in his gay light blue coat and white underclothes, screaming and chattering, nodding and bobbing and bowing, and pretending to be on good terms with every songster of the grove. 
As Ichabod jogged slowly on his way, his eye, ever open to every symptom of culinary abundance, ranged with delight over the treasures of jolly autumn. On all sides he beheld vast store of apples, some hanging in oppressive opulence on the trees, some gathered into baskets and barrels for the market, others heaped up in rich piles for the cider press. Farther on he beheld great fields of Indian corn, with its golden ears peeping from their leafy converts, and holding out the promise of cakes and hasty pudding, and the yellow pumpkins lying beneath them, turning up their fair round bellies to the sun, and giving ample prospects of the most luxurious of pies, and anon he passed the fragrant buckwheat fields, breathing the odor of the beehive, and as he beheld them, soft anticipations stole over his mind of dainty slapjacks, well buttered and garnished with honey or trickle, by the delicate little dimpled hand of Katerina Van Tassel. Thus, feeding his mind with many sweet thoughts and sugared suppositions, he journeyed along the sides of a range of hills which look out upon some of the goodliest scenes of the mighty Hudson. The sun gradually wheeled his broad disk down in the west. The wide bosom of the Tapanzi lay motionless and glassy, excepting that here and there a gentle undulation waved and prolonged the blue shadow in the distant mountain. A few amber clouds floated in the sky without a breath of air to move them. The horizon was of a fine golden tint, changing gradually into a pure apple green, and from that into the deep blue of the mid-heaven. A slanting ray lingered on the woody crests of the precipices that overhung some parts of the river, giving greater depth to the dark gray and purple of their rocky sides. A sloop was loitering in the distance, dropping slowly down with the tide, her sail hanging uselessly against the mast, and, as the reflection of the sky gleamed along the still water, it seemed as if the vessel was suspended in air. It was toward evening that Ichabod arrived at the castle of the Heer van Tassel, which he found thronged with the pride and flower of the adjacent country. Old farmers, a spare leathern-faced race, in homespun coats and breeches, blue stockings, huge shoes, and magnificent pewter buckles. Their brisk, withered little dames in close-crimped caps, long-waisted short gowns, homespun petticoats with scissors and pincushions, and gay calico pockets hanging on the outside, buxom lasses almost as antiquated as their mothers, excepting where a straw hat, a fine ribbon, or perhaps a white frock gave symptoms of city innovation. The sons in short, square-skirted coats, with rows of stupendous brass buttons, and their hair generally cued in the fashion of the times, especially if they could procure an eel-skin for the purpose. It being esteemed throughout the country, as a potent nourisher and strengthener of the hair. Brom Bones, however, was the hero of the scene, having come to the gathering on his favorite steed Daredevil, a creature like himself, full of metal and mischief, and which no one but himself could manage. He was, in fact, noted for preferring vicious animals, given to all kinds of tricks which kept the rider in a constant risk of his neck, for he held a tractable, well-broken horse as unworthy of a lad of spirit. Fain would I pause to dwell upon the world of charms that burst upon the enraptured gaze of my hero as he entered the state parlor of Van Tassel's mansion, not those of the bevy of buxom lasses with their luxurious display of red and white, but the ample charms of a genuine Dutch country tea-table in the sumptuous time of autumn. Such heaped-up platters of cakes of various and almost indescribable kinds, known only to experienced Dutch housewives. 
There was the doughty doughnut, the tender oly cook, and the crisp and crumbling cruller, sweet cakes and short cakes, ginger cakes and honey cakes, and the whole family of cakes. And then there were apple pies, and peach pies, and pumpkin pies, and besides slices of ham, and smoked beef, and moreover delectable dishes of preserved plums, and peaches, and pears, and quinces, not to mention broiled shad, and roasted chickens, together with bowls of milk and cream, all mingled higgledy-piggledy, pretty much as I have enumerated them, with the motherly teapot sending up its clouds of vapor from the mist. Heaven bless the mark. I want breath and time to discuss this banquet as it deserves, and am too eager to get on with my story. Happily, Ichabod Crane was not in so great a hurry as his historian, but did ample justice to every dainty. He was a kind and thankful creature, whose heart dilated in proportion as his skin was filled with good cheer, and whose spirits rose with eating as some men's do with drink. He would not help, too, rolling his large eyes about him as he ate, and chuckling with the possibility that he might one day be lord of all this scene of almost unimaginable luxury and splendor. Then he thought how soon he'd turn his back upon the old schoolhouse, snap his fingers in the face of Hans van Ripper, kick any itinerant pedagogue out the doors that he should dare to call him comrade. Old Baltus von Tassel moved about among his guests with a face dilated with content and good humor, round and jolly as the harvest moon. His hospitable attentions were brief but expressive, being confined to a shake of the hand, a slap on the shoulder, a loud laugh, and a pressing invitation to fall to and help themselves. And now the sound of the music from the common room or hall summoned to the dance. The Ichabod prided himself upon his dancing as much as upon his vocal powers. Not a limb, not a fiber about him was idle, and to have seen his loosely hung frame in full motion and clattering about the room you would have thought St. Vitus himself, that blessed patron of the dance, was figuring before you in person. How could the flogger of urchins be otherwise than animated and joyous? The lady of his heart was his partner in the dance, and smiling graciously in reply to all his amorous oglings, while Brom Bones, sorely smitten with love and jealousy, sat brooding by himself in the corner. When the dance was at an end, Ichabod was attracted to a knot of the sager folks who, with old Van Tassel, sat smoking at one end of the piazza, gossiping over former times, and drawing out the long stories about the war. This neighborhood, at the time of which I am speaking, was one of those highly favored places which abound with chronicle and great men. The British and American line had run near it during the war, and it had, therefore, been the scene of marauding and infested with refugees, cowboys, and all kinds of border chivalry. Just sufficient time had elapsed to enable each storyteller to dress up his tale with a little becoming fiction, and in the indistinctness of his recollection to make himself the hero of every exploit. There was the story of Dofu Martling, a large, blue-bearded Dutchman who had nearly taken a British frigate with an old iron nine-pounder from a mud breastwork, only that his gun burst at the sixth discharge. And there was an old gentleman who shall be nameless, being too rich a mineer to be lightly mentioned, who, in the Battle of White Plains, being an excellent master of defense, parried a musket-ball with a small sword, insomuch that he absolutely felt it whiz round the blade and glance off the hilt, in proof of which he was ready at any time to show the sword, with the hilt a little bent. There were several more that had been equally great in that field, not one of whom but was persuaded that he had a considerable hand in bringing the war to a happy termination. 
But all these were nothing to the tales of ghosts and apparitions that succeeded. The neighborhood was rich in legendary treasures of the kind. Local tales and superstitions thrive best in these sheltered, long-settled retreats, but are trampled underfoot by the shifting throng that forms the population of most country places. Besides, there is no encouragement for ghosts in most of our villages, for they have scarcely had time to finish their first nap and turn themselves over in their graves before their surviving friends have traveled away from the neighborhood, so that when they turn out at night to walk their rounds, they have no acquaintance left to call upon. This is perhaps the reason why we so seldom hear of ghosts, except in our long-established Dutch communities. The immediate cause, however, of the prevalence of supernatural stories in these parts was doubtless owing to the vicinity of Sleepy Hollow. There was a contagion in the very air that blew from that haunted region. It breathed forth an atmosphere of dreams and fancies infecting all the land. Several of the Sleepy Hollow people were present at Van Tassel's, and, as usual, were doling out their wild and wonderful legends. Many dismal tales were told about funeral trains and mourning cries and wailings heard and seen about the great tree where the unfortunate Major André was taken, and which stood in the neighborhood. Some mention was also given of the women in white that haunted the dark glen at Raven Rock, and was often heard to shriek on winter nights before a storm, having perished there in the snow. The chief part of the stories, however, turned about the favorite specter of Sleepy Hollow, the headless horseman, who had been heard several times of late patrolling the country, and, it was said, tethered his horse nightly among the graves in the churchyard. The sequestered situation of this church seems always to have made it a favorite haunt of troubled spirits. It stands on a knoll surrounded by locust trees and lofty elms, from among which its decent whitewashed walls shine modestly forth like Christian purity beaming through the shades of retirement. A gentle slope descends from it to a silver sheet of water bordered by high trees, between which peeps may be caught at the blue hills of the Hudson. To look upon its grass-grown yard where the sunbeams seem to sleep so quietly, one would think that there, at least, the dead might rest in peace. On one side of the church extends a wide woolly dell, along which raves of a large brook among broken rocks and trunks of fallen-down trees. Over a deep black part of the stream not far from the church was formerly thrown a wooden bridge. The road that led to it and the bridge itself were thickly shaded by overhanging trees, which cast a gloom about it even in the daytime, but occasioned a fearful darkness at night. Such was one of the favorite haunts of the headless horseman, and the place where he was most frequently encountered. The tale was told of old Brewer, the most heretical disbeliever in ghosts, of how he met the horseman returning from his foray into Sleepy Hollow, and was obliged to get up behind him, and how they galloped over bush and brake over hill and swamp until they reached the bridge when the horseman suddenly turned into a skeleton, threw old Broer into the brook, and sprang away over the treetops with a clap of thunder. This story was immediately matched by a thrice marvelous adventure of Brom Bones, who made light of the galloping Hessian as an errant jockey. He affirmed that on returning one night from the neighboring village of Sing Sing he had been overtaken by this midnight trooper, that he had offered to race him for a bowl of punch, and should have won it, too, for Daredevil beat that goblin horse all hollow. But just as they came to the church bridge, the Hessian bolted and vanished in a flash of fire. 
All these tales told in that drowsy undertone with which men talk in the dark, the countenances of the listeners only now and then receiving a casual gleam from the glare of a pipe, sank deep in the mind of Ichabod. He repaid them in kind with large extracts from his invaluable author Cotton Mather, and added many marvelous events that had taken place in his native state of Connecticut, and fearful sights which he had seen in his nightly walks about Sleepy Hollow. The rebel now gradually broke up. The old farmers gathered together their families in their wagons, and were heard for some time rattling along the hollow roads and over the distant hills. Some of the damsels mounted on pillions behind their favorite swains, and their light-hearted laughter, mingling with the clatter of hooves, echoed through the dark, silent woodlands, sounding fainter and fainter until they gradually died away, and the late scene of noise and frolic was all silent and deserted. Ichabod only lingered behind, according to the custom of country lovers, to have a tete-a-tete -tete with the heiress, fully convinced that he was now on the high road to success. What passed at this interview I will not pretend to say, for, in fact, I do not know. Something, however, I fear me must have gone wrong, for he certainly sallied forth after no very great interval with an air quite desolate and chapfallen. Oh, these women! These women! Could that girl have been playing off any of her coquettish tricks? Was her encouragement of the poor pedagogue all a mere sham to secure her conquest of his rival? Heaven only knows, not I. Let it suffice to say that Ichabod stole forth with the air of one who has been sacking a hen-roost, rather than a fair lady's heart. Without looking to either left or right to notice the scene of rural wealth on which he had so often gloated, he went straight to the stable, and with several hearty cuffs and kicks roused his steed most uncourteously from the comfortable quarters in which he was soundly sleeping, dreaming of mountains of corn and oats, and whole valleys of timothy and clover. It was the very witching time of night that Ichabod, heavy-hearted and crestfallen, pursued his travels homewards along the sides of the lofty hills which rise above Tarrytown, and which he had traversed so cheerily in the afternoon. The hour was as dismal as himself. Far below the Tapanzi spread its dusky and indistinct waste of waters, with here and there the tall mast of a sloop riding quietly at anchor under the land. In the dead hush of midnight he could even hear the barking of the watchdog from the opposite shore of the Hudson. But it was so vague and faint as to only give an idea of his distance from the faithful companion of man. Now and then, too, the long, drawn-out crowing of a cock accidentally awakened would sound far, far off, from some farmhouse away from the hills. But it was like a dreaming sound in his ear. No sounds of life occurred near him, but occasionally the melancholy chirp of a cricket or perhaps the guttural twang of a bullfrog in its neighboring marsh, as if sleeping uncomfortably and turning suddenly in his bed. All the stories of ghosts and goblins that he had heard in the afternoon now came crowding upon his recollection. The night grew darker and darker. The stars seemed to sink deeper in the sky, and driving clouds occasionally hid them from his sight. He had never felt so lonely and dismal. He was, moreover, approaching the very place where many of the scenes of the ghost stories had been laid. In the center of the road stood an enormous tulip-tree, which towered like a giant above all the other trees of the neighborhood, and formed a kind of landmark. 
Its limbs were gnarled and fantastic, large enough to form trunks for ordinary trees, twisting down almost to the earth and rising again into the air. It was connected with the tragical story of the unfortunate André, who had been taken prisoner hard by, and was universally known by the name of Major André's Tree. The common people regarded it with a mixture of respect and superstition, partly out of sympathy for the fate of its ill-starred namesake, and partly from the tales of strange sights and doleful lamentations told concerning it. As Ichabod approached this fearful tree, he began to whistle. He thought his whistle was answered, but it was but a blast sweeping sharply through the dry branches. As he approached a little nearer, he thought he saw something white hanging in the midst of the trees. He paused and ceased whistling, but on looking more narrowly he perceived that it was a place where the tree had been scathed by lightning and the white wood laid bare. Suddenly he heard a groan, his teeth chattered, his knees smote against the saddle. It was but the rubbing of one huge bough upon another, as they were swayed about by the breeze. He passed the tree in safety, but new perils lay before him. About a hundred yards from the tree a small brook crossed the road and ran into a marshy and thickly wooded glen, known by the name of Wiley's Swamp. A few rough logs laid side by side served for a bridge over this stream. On that side of the road, where the brook entered the wood, a group of oaks and chestnuts matted thick with wild grapevines threw a cavernous gloom over it. To pass this bridge was the severest trial. It was at this identical spot that the unfortunate André was captured, and under the covert of these chestnuts and vines were the sturdy yeomen concealed who surprised him. This has ever been considered a haunted stream, and fearful are the feelings of the schoolboy who has to pass it alone after dark. As he approached the stream, his heart began to thump. He summoned up, however, all his resolution, gave his horse half a score of kicks in the ribs, and attempted to dash briskly across the bridge. But instead of starting forward, the perverse old animal made a lateral movement, and ran broadside against the fence. Ichabod, whose fears increased with the delay, jerked the reins on the other side, and kicked lustily with the contrary foot. It was all in vain. His steed started, it is true, but it was only to plunge to the opposite side of the road into a new thicket of brambles and alder bushes. The schoolmaster now bestowed both whip and heel upon the quivering ribs of old Gunpowder, who dashed forward, snuffling and snorting, but came to a stand just by the bridge with a suddenness that had nearly sent his rider sprawling over his head. Just at this moment, a plashy tramp by the side of the bridge caught the sensitive ear of Ichabod. In the dark shadow of the grove, on the margin of the brook, he beheld something huge, misshapen and towering. It stirred not, but seemed gathered up by the gloom like some gigantic monster ready to spring upon the traveller. The hair of the affrighted pedagogue rose upon his head with terror. What was to be done? To turn and fly was now too late, and besides what chance was there of escaping a ghost or a goblin, if such it was, which could ride upon the wings of the wind? Summoning up there for a show of courage, he demanded in stammering accents, Who, who are you? He received no reply. He repeated his demand in a still more agitated voice. Still there was no answer. Once more he cudgeled the sides of the inflexible gunpowder, and, shutting his eyes, broke forth with involuntary fervor into a psalm tune. Just then the shadowy object of alarm put itself in motion with a scramble and a bound stood at once in the middle of the road. 
though the night was dark and dismal, yet the form of the unknown might now in some degree be ascertained. He appeared to be a horseman of large dimensions, and mounted on a black horse of powerful frame. He made no offer of molestation or sociability, but came aloof on one side of the road, jogging along on the blind side of old Gunpowder, who had now got over his fright and waywardness. Ichabod, who had no relish for this strange midnight companion, and bethought himself of the adventure of Brom Bones with the galloping Hessian, now quickened his steed in hopes of leaving him behind. The stranger, however, quickened his horse to an equal pace. Ichabod pulled up, fell into a walk, thinking to lag behind, but the other did the same. His heart began to sink within him. He endeavored to resume his psalm tune, but his parched tongue clove to the roof of his mouth, and he could not utter a stave. There was something in the moody and dogged silence of this pretentious companion that was mysterious and appalling. It was soon fearfully accounted for, on mounting a rising ground which brought the figure of his fellow-traveller in relief against the sky, gigantic in height and muffled in a cloak. Ichabod was horror-struck on perceiving that he was headless. But his horror was still more increased on observing that the head, which should have rested on his shoulders, was carried before him on the pommel of his saddle. His terror rose to desperation. He rained a shower of kicks and blows upon gunpowder, hoping by sudden movement to give his companion the slip. But the spectre started full jump with him. Away, then, they dashed through the thick and thin, stones flying, sparks flashing at every bound. Ichabod's flimsy garments fluttered in the air as he stretched his long, lank body away over his horse's head in the eagerness of his flight. They had now reached the road which turns off to Sleepy Hollow. But Gunpowder, who seemed possessed with a demon instead of keeping up it, made an opposite turn, and plunged headlong downhill to the left. This road leads through a sandy hollow shaded by trees for about a quarter of a mile where it crosses the famous bridge of the goblin story, and just beyond swells the green knoll on which stands the whitewashed church. As yet the panic of the steed had given his unskillful rider an apparent advantage in the chase, but just as he had got halfway through the hollow, the girths of the saddle gave way, and he felt it slipping under him. He seized it by the pommel and endeavored to hold it firm, but in vain, and he had just time to save himself by clasping old gunpowder round the neck, when the saddle fell to the earth and he heard it trampled underfoot by his pursuer. For a moment the terror of Hans von Ripper's wrath passed across his mind, for it was his Sunday saddle, but this was no time for petty fears. The goblin was hard on his haunches, and unskillful rider that he was, he had much ado to maintain his seat, sometimes slipping on one side and sometimes on another, and sometimes jolted on the high ridge of his horse's backbone with a violence that he verily feared would cleave him asunder. An opening in the trees now cheered him with the hopes that the church bridge was at hand. The wavering reflection of a silver star in the bosom of the brook told him he was not mistaken. He saw the walls of the church dimly glaring under the trees beyond. He recollected the place where Brom Bone's ghostly competitor has disappeared. If I can but reach that bridge, thought Ichabod, I am safe. Just then he heard the black steed panting and blowing close behind him, and even fancied that he felt its hot breath. Another convulsive kick in the ribs, and old gunpowder sprang upon the bridge. He thundered over the resounding planks. He gained the opposite side, and now Ichabod cast a look behind to see if his pursuer should vanish according to rule in a flash of fire and brimstone. Just then he saw the goblin rising in his stirrups, and in the very act of hurling his head at him. Ichabod endeavored to dodge the horrible missile, but too late. It encountered his cranium with a tremendous crash. He was tumbled headlong into the dust, and gunpowder, the black steed, and the goblin rider all passed by like a whirlwind. The next morning the old horse was found without his saddle, and with the bridle under his feet, 
soberly cropping the grass at his master's gate. Ichabod did not make his appearance at breakfast. Dinner hour came, but no Ichabod. The boys assembled at the schoolhouse and strolled idly about the banks of the brook, but no schoolmaster. Hans von Ripper began to feel some uneasiness about the fate of poor Ichabod and his saddle. An inquiry was set afoot, and after diligent investigation they came upon his traces. In one part of the road leading to the church he found the saddle trampled in the dirt. The tracks of horses' hooves deeply dented the road, and evidently at furious speed were traced to the bridge, beyond which, on the bank of a broad part of the brook, where the water ran deep and black, was found the hat of the unfortunate Ichabod, and close beside it a shattered pumpkin. The brook was searched, but the body of the schoolmaster was not to be discovered. Hans von Ripper, as executor of his estate, examined the bundle which contained all his worldly effects. They consisted of two shirts and a half, two socks for the neck, a pair of two worsted stockings, an old pair of corduroy small clothes, a rusty razor, a book of psalm tunes full of dog ears, and a broken pitch pipe. As to the books and furniture of the schoolhouse, they belonged to the community, excepting Cotton Mather's History of Witchcraft, a New England Almanac, and a book of dreams and fortune-telling, in which last was a sheet of foolscap much scribbled and blotted in several fruitless attempts to make a copy of verses in honor of the heiress of Van Tassel. These magic books and the poetic scroll were forthwith consigned to the flames by Hans von Ripper, who from that time forward determined to send his children no more to school, observing that he never knew any good came of that same reading and writing. Whatever money the schoolmaster possessed, and he had received his quarter's pay but a day or two before, he must have had about his person at the time of his disappearance. The mysterious event caused much speculation at the church on the following Sunday. Knots of gazers and gossips were collected in the churchyard, at the bridge, and at the spot where the hat and pumpkin had been found. The stories of Broer, of Bones, and of a whole budget of others were called to mind, and when they had diligently considered them all and compared them with the symptoms of the present case, they shook their heads and came to the conclusion that Ichabod had been carried off by the galloping Hessian. As he was a bachelor and in nobody's debt, nobody troubled his head any more about him, and the school was removed to a different quarter of the hollow, and another pedagogue reigned in his stead. It is true an old farmer who had been down to New York on a visit several years earlier, and from whom this account of the ghostly adventure was received, brought home the intelligence that Ichabod Crane was still alive, and that had left the neighborhood partly through fear of the goblin and Hans van Ripper, and partly in mortification at having been suddenly dismissed by the heiress, that he had changed his quarters to a distant part of the country, and kept school and studied law at the same time, had been admitted to the bar, turned politician, electioneered, written for the newspapers, and finally had been made a justice of the ten-pound court. Brom Bones, too, who shortly after his rival's disappearance conducted the blooming Katrina in triumph to the altar, was observed to look exceedingly knowing whenever the story of Ichabod was related, and always burst into a hearty laugh at the mention of the pumpkin, which led some to suspect that he knew more about the matter than he chose to tell. The old country wives, however, who were the best judges of these matters, maintain to this day that Ichabod was spirited away by supernatural means, and it is a favorite story often told about the neighborhood round the winter evening fire. The bridge became more than ever an object of superstitious awe, and that may be the reason why the road has been altered of late years, 
so as to approach the church by the border of the mill-pond. The schoolhouse, being deserted, soon fell to decay, and was reported to be haunted by the ghost of the unfortunate pedagogue and the ploughboy, loitering homeward of a still summer evening, has often fancied his voice at a distance, chanting a melancholy psalm-tune among the tranquil solitudes of Sleepy Hollow. And so ends the Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving.